Hello, 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 it's Attorney Mike Gravel coming to you from Chicago as usual. I forgot to get the clip. I forgot to get the clip. Oh no. Okay, I think that's it. Wait, 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 wait. I'm I'm not done chatting here. I gotta do my intro. <laughs> we we've got us divorced. This is this is really cool. Oh, let me, let me figure that out too. It was Patriot 101, I believe, but let me make sure. Courage 101 sent me this video. It's fascinating. It's a divorce in Washington state. It involves, uh, well, they say during this, I don't know because I don't know the background, but it's claimed during the proceedings that uh, associated with this is the largest personal bankruptcy in the history of Washington state. So that's the background of what we're dealing with here. It, it everybody uh, I told I, I mentioned this earlier on another stream. It's a little off brand for me. The attorneys make a lot of sense and make good arguments. The uh, the judge makes a lot of sense. It seems to be under control. The litigants don't say a lot of stupid things. I the the husband doesn't talk much at all, which is wise, which is wise. So we don't have our usual thing, <clears throat> and it's a little serious. Although it's fascinating, it's a it's it's a really interesting story. It's interesting legally, and it's in, it's interesting factually. So uh, you know, I don't know if the, this is the the prices. I'm not familiar with them, um, but but maybe out maybe out west, uh, people people might know who these people are. Uh, but the, let's uh, let's get this thing started. Although, although the last time I thought I had a really serious one, which I did, I can't remember the video. But one of the participants had the name Sprinkles, and another one, I, an attorney in there, had the last name of Shart. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm going for a couple hours of serious here, and yeah, no, no. Then the chat had me going about Sprinkles and Shart all day. <laughs> I didn't notice anything here. I didn't notice anything here. But if if something's out of line, I'm sure the chat will inform me. Let's get started. Everybody there? We're here. We're here. Here we go, Your Honor. Thank you. <coughs> All right, I think we're set. Okay, cross examination when you're ready, Mr. Nelson. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Price. Good afternoon. You indicated that you graduated from Central Washington University, correct? Yes. And what do you have a degree in? Business. And is that a bachelor's of science? Yes. <laughs> oh, no. Could I Thanks, direct Saturday. your attention to exhibit 30? Yes. <laughs> if I'm to understand your description of this document, the, the numbers and descriptions that run down the left side are estimates of monthly expenses. Do I have that right? It's possible. They were actually what was paid. We've got Some might be bow tie. Some are what was actually paid. There might be learning. Maybe I could recast it this way. This is what you and Mr. Price believed it was going to cost you each month to run the household, correct? Some of these figures are what it costs to run the household. A couple I'm not so sure of. But, but it's fair to say that this is what you estimated you would need to run your household after Tom left. No, they're not estimates. I see maybe two that are, maybe more than two, but they're not estimates. They were based on actual costs that we had been paying prior. Understood. All right, but when you add all those up, and I'm assuming that the math is done correctly here, it's a solid test, you Charles. come up with $13,907 a month. Yes. All right. And then I think you testified, you multiply that by 12 and get 166,884. <laughs> 
Yes. Okay. And then in addition to these kind of reoccurring monthly expenses, we have another column on the right-hand side of the document, correct? Yes. And I think I understand it says Easter, something Valentine's Day, Nordstrom card, Bellarmine, birthdays, travel, Nordstrom's, Christmas. And when you add up all of those, I guess, annual or annualized expenses, on my word, not yours, you come up with $73,500. Yes. All right. And then right below that is what Tom represents his income to be. Do I have that correct? To my knowledge, yes. But that's what he told you the income was, correct? That, yeah, yes. Right. Yep. And I want to be sure I've got the date right. This document was I'm going to discuss between the two of you in January of 2018. Oh, thank you. January 7th, 2018. Okay, so, so January 7th, 2018, you understood his net income to be $210,000, correct? That's what he said. All right. And then it looks to me that that there's a number here. Uh, it says $240,384, and that's under the circled 166884. Thank you, Lauren. Have I identified for everybody's satisfaction the number I'm looking at? Yes. Okay, and, and did I understand your testimony correctly that the way you got the 24384 was adding the 166884 and the 73? It is for me. Tom added it. Tom added it. Okay, and Tom's a numbers guy, so we can <laughs> trust his math, correct? Well, Thank you, well I don't know about that. I would just say Tom added it. Okay. And when, um, and you do see that there's a discrepancy here between what his uh, net income is in 2018 versus what it costs to run your household. Yeah, I never questioned his salary. All right. And so you didn't know what he earned in 2010? Oh, excuse me, let me rephrase the question. That's not what I meant to say. So you didn't know what he earned in 2018? He doesn't share. He never shared, rarely shared his income. Okay, so the, I think this is 2019 or 2020, th this hearing. So obviously he made a mistake when he asked about the income of 2010, which really can't be very relevant at this point. With me. He just paid for everything. All right. And so then it's also true that you don't know how much Mr. Price earned or has uh, earned year to date in the year 2020? To my knowledge, I don't know that. You testified that Tom Price paid for Carter's tuition last year at WSU. Did I understand that correctly? I was told that by Tom. Tom told you he paid for WSU? Yes. Did he tell you he was going to pay for WSU um, <laughs> this year as well? <laughs> I don't know if he said those exact words. We, we don't communicate right now. And, but it's your understanding that the bills are getting paid. What bills? The, the WSU bills. I'm speaking just kind of general here. The, I, the current WSU bill, like for today? Yeah. I hope so. Okay, so you, it, it, would it be a better question to say you don't know if the WSU expenses are covered for the first semester of uh, this school year? Well, to my knowledge, I wouldn't know that right now. I don't see a bill. Okay, so she's honest. I, I will give her this. She doesn't know anything. He took care of everything. I, I, I don't know. The implication is here that this guy is sleazy. I don't know that he is. I think he's hiding money. I have no idea. But I, I think he's definitely hiding money from the court. 
I, I don't know about his business dealings because I'm not familiar with him. I don't know the background. That's that's just my gut reaction. But she literally doesn't know anything. He took care of everything. And that's what that's what she keeps saying. Prium was a very, very successful company, right? To my knowledge, yes. Okay. And and when I'm asking you these questions, I, I only want what is your knowledge. So I, I understand that your answers are to your knowledge. Um Is Priam, as far as a, a company or entity goes, completely defunct now? I wouldn't know that for sure. Okay. Do you believe that Priam is still a company that earns money? It could. No, th this is his attorney. It's cross examination. You know, based on things. I don't know. I don't know what level to bore you with. It's strange that they start the hearing with cross examination. Uh, I would typically call that. I would typically refer to that as calling an adverse witness, not, uh, which which you treat as cross examination. But that that seems to be where the hearing starts. That happened with Priam. Um, is it true that you and Mr. Price? participated in one of the largest bankruptcies, individual bankruptcies in Washington state history? I wouldn't know that for sure. I believe her. I mean, she, she's like, it's, it's plausible, but I don't know. I haven't checked the bankruptcy filings. Do you know or do you recall the amount of unsecured credit that was addressed in your individual bankruptcy? No. Did you testified that there were various documents that were presented to you that you just simply signed? Were these bankruptcy documents ones that you signed but didn't read? Yes. Is it fair to say that throughout the marriage, when financial documents were presented to you, you signed them without reading them. For the most part, yes. Do you have independent knowledge of whether or not Radiance Capital Finance has made any money in the year 2020? I don't. Do you have any personal knowledge about whether or not Claire LLC shows any net income in the year 2020? I didn't receive the Claire bank, bank statements, otherwise I might. So I, at this time, with the information I have in front of me or in this room, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know that. That can happen, Gary. The same question. Do you have any individual or independent knowledge of whether or not SPAR and LLC has earned any income in the year 2020? And again, it's a simple yes or no question. Well, I would answer that I don't have enough information to know that for sure. So fair to say you don't know? Fair to say I don't have enough information to know that for sure. You testified that you are living with someone you're dating. Um, what's his or her name? Mr. Holsher. And where do the two of you reside? He has a place in Fircrest. Okay. Is it a home that he owns? No, it's not a home. I find it interesting how much uh, Thomas Price here just just has zero Fs to give about this whole situation. <laughs> he doesn't care. <laughs> what sort of dwelling is it? It's an apartment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And and um, what does he do for a living? He works at Boeing. And do you know what his income is? No, I don't. And did I understand your uh, testimony correctly that he, he's not seeking rent or monthly living expenses from you right now? 
I don't think we talked about that. Okay. Is he asking you for monthly rent payments? We discussed that when this was over, we would figure something out. We didn't know how long this would last. So here we are today, yeah. and when this is figured out, we will have that discussion again. She's being coy. She She's not saying everything she knows, but she doesn't know much. She doesn't know much. Um, she, she, she sat on the yacht and drank the champagne and had a party. She went along with everything. She didn't care if it was above board or not at the time. The party is over. She's, you know, not now she's actually discussing splitting rent with her boyfriend, apparently. You know, obviously the world has turned. Okay, so, but, but at present he hasn't asked you for anything. Is that uh, accurate? No, that's not accurate. What has he asked you for? We're going to discuss what we're going to do based upon how long this drags out and until I am paid some support and then we're going to make a decision about what would be a fair thing to do. How long have you been staying with um, your partner? I've been staying with my friends since February 1st. Since right. the lease ended in the last house. Her friend? Please. And <laughs> what have you done to seek employment? And I'll, I can only qualify that. What have you done to seek employment since this divorce has started? Well, Tom told me he would take care of me for the rest of my life. Tom told me to go find something uh -huh. to do. You don't need to earn a nickel. I just want you to be happy. Based on what Tom told me, I don't think that that is something he's wanting to do. He provided me a budget and said those statements to me. Okay, but ma'am. Okay, so she's still completely hung up on him, which is understandable. We're talking about a 30-year marriage here. I don't, I don't mean to make light of it. Okay, yeah, I do. But, you know, she, she's that, – that, oh, God. This poor other guy, I feel, I, feel, I feel horrible for him. That wasn't my question at all. My question was, what have you done to seek employment since this divorce started? I haven't done anything to seek employment. You testified that you don't hold any assets. Is that correct? Do you want to be more specific about assets? Especially if it's well, mine. I'm, I'm just kind of parroting back what your attorney asked you. What type of assets are you talking about? Any right. asset. Any property tangible or other that has value. I have uh, clothing, shoes, purses, and jewelry. Those are my personal assets. I have furniture in storage and dishes and cookware. Those would be my assets. Okay. Do you hold Microsoft stock somewhere? Yes, I have stock. Okay. Dishes and... Microsoft stock that I didn't mention. <laughs> yeah, your dishes don't have any value, but the Microsoft stock does. <laughs> okay. Now, why is it that you didn't tell the court about that in direct testimony? I didn't recall that stock was an asset at that moment. Oh, okay. Do you now please. understand what assets a are? Goat. Well, I think so. <laughs> okay. And, and I guess... Uh, um, I would just perhaps characterize the things that you describe, like purses, coats, cookware, things of that nature as personal property. Uh, while certainly they might be assets, I'm really asking about things that All are more financial uh, in nature. So aside from the Microsoft stock, 
do you hold any assets? What what other assets are you asking me about? Any. Nelson, can we just ask her right out? Have you got an insurance policy? Have you got a bank account? Have you got an, an, a stock brokerage account? Do you have an IRA? Okay, that's a bad sign for her when the judge realizes that she's so obstructionist on this point. Generally, they're behaving themselves, but she's she's obviously not being forthcoming here. And the judge is saying, just go down the list of assets because it's harder for her to dodge. That, that's not a good sign for her. 401k. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you hold any financial products similar to the ones that Judge Hushkoff just identified? IRAs, savings accounts, brokerage accounts. Right? Any sort of financial product with your name on it, or or Mr. Price's name on it, for that matter. Well, I believe Mr. Price holds a Price Family Trust, and I'm listed as a beneficiary on it. Um, so that's something. <laughs> that could be worth anything from zero to a billion dollars. Okay, something you want to mention. So, what I would be a beneficiary of that, so I would have that asset. Um, okay. I have asked him for that, and he declines that. Um, I know he had life insurance policies at one time. Um, yeah, well, he's alive. I have a savings account with zero balance. Okay. How much is your interest? Uh, worth in the Price Family Trust? I don't know that answer. What is the value of the Microsoft stock that you hold? I have 93 shares, so whatever they're worth today is would be the value, and I'm, I don't know what that is. And where are those shares held? Are they in a brokerage account, or do you have stock certificates? I think it's an account. Do you know where that account is? I don't. Ah, more info. Well, of course, I mean, the, like that, that's interesting, but I'm. Are you aware like, that I assume um, that without there's some. <laughs> I just assume that going in <laughs> against you and Mr. Price that are somewhere in the twenty-five million dollar range. Tom has mentioned a judgment. So your only knowledge of a twenty-five million dollar judgment is because Tom told you about it. Tom told. Tom mentioned something about a judgment. What, what do you want? Told me about a judgment. And he said I was not liable for it. Is that your belief? You know, I don't know. I was left out of the whole process, and I don't, I don't know for for true. I don't know for sure or not. You have a master's of science in business. I have. A, I don't have a master's of science. I have a business degree that's obsolete. Oh, is it a is it a bachelor's? I I may have misunderstood then your answer. In any event, you you've got a business degree, and are you stating that you don't know what a judgment is? Yes. I, I get his point, but a, a, a twenty year old business degree from uh, Washington Central does does not imply a knowledge of uh, an intimate knowledge of judgments. I get what he's trying to do here. But I don't think it's very effective. All right. Um, are you aware of any other debts that that are are levied against you or uh, um, held against the the mar marital community? Yes. In in the financial declaration, there is a Nordstrom card that's listed on number nine that that we didn't discuss. That balance is seventy eight sixty five. I did just make a payment on that yesterday of one fifty three. That account was what Tom and I used for 
Chris, Christmas shopping for the kids or I used it for other things, but that is something if you look on the on exhibit 30 where it says Nordstrom card $6,000. Do you see that on the right? Mm -hmm. Tom said he would pay that off. At okay, ma'am, we're getting a little far afield here. Just wanted to know what debts exist. And I, well, I think I've got you know, it's all about the crappy $7,800 with Nordstrom, but not about the $25 million judgment. And I believe her. I believe her. She doesn't know anything. Yeah, to her credit, she was busy raising a family, which is a which is a fine thing to do. He took care of everything. She didn't she didn't really know what was going on. She had her suspicions, but she's not asking questions, and that's where we are. That's great. Yep. You presently owe Nordstrom's seventy eight sixty five. We do, yes. Yep. You said you owed one of your landlords seven thousand dollars. Do I have that yep. correct? Yes. Okay. And that there's a twenty-six million dollar judgment um, out of a King County lawsuit that is levied against you, Mr. Price, in the Maryland community. I don't know if you have the correct amount. I don't know what the correct amount is, and I would need to discuss that with the judgment holder and find out if that's indeed the truth. Okay. Oh, it is. Um, no further questions. Thank you. <laughs> you don't need to discuss it with the judgment. Is there a judgment? It, it, it's it's got to be filed. There's a judge's signature on it. It's a, there, There's all sorts of stuff. The judgment holder isn't going to discuss it with you other than to say, are you going to pay me? Redirect. Redirect, Mr. Robinson. You know, that's interesting. I watched this and I haven't seen all of it, but I've seen a good portion of it. I don't know what this guy's actual business is. I don't know if he's got a legitimate empire that's doing well and he's hiding it or if it was some some fraudulent nonsense, you know, nonsense uh, kind of a thing. I don't know. I don't know. It, it could go either way, but. You know what? Either way, he he acquired a bunch of cash, and now and now he's claiming he doesn't have any, which I don't believe. Mr. Robinson, you're on mute, but I also I also don't see your lips moving. <laughs> that I've been told that uh, mute is just one of a couple of things that I am. Um, Nordstrom's out of Seattle. That's like, I mean, that's like mainstream. I mean, yeah, Nordstrom's a nice store. I, I go to Nordstrom here too, or whatever. But I, that's just. That's standard issue. If you're from Seattle, you're going to have a Nordstrom account. I apologize. Um, I have no further witnesses, but before I rest, could we go through the exhibit list and see oh, what... I think you have no other questions uh, for Mrs. Price. That is correct. Well, <laughs> I think I might have a couple. Oh, okay. Because so, I want to make a couple things clear. Oh, Maria. Okay. So we've got the... You, you had to give up the eight-carat... Diamond ring. Yes, I did. Did Jeff give up any other jewelry to the bankruptcy trustee or to anyone else? Tom took some of our jewelry and said he was going to sell it. Um, I don't. It was mostly his watches, but it was a couple little piece gold pieces of mine. I never heard back if it was sold or if he got money for it or saw money from it. So of the um, jewelry that you've retained, how much would you say that would be is worth if you, were try to, if you tried to sell it today? Well, that's a hard question because they, they were gifts from Tom. And I don't know the sale, selling value of it. Um, Maybe a couple thousand dollars, but I I would I would be unsure with of that. Okay. How about the jewelry he retained? He has that I know of three valuable watches that were fifty thousand, fifteen thousand, and another 
eleven thousand dollar watch but he told me it was worth thirty thousand now again i don't know what the resale is on those items but i would say the watches he has were bought because they retained value but i i, I can't even guess that it would be more than that so you're uh, saying so you're saying like eighty five to hundred thousand dollars I don't know why the judge is going down this path with her. She she truly does not know the the the, uh, the current market value of his watches. I'm confident she does not know that. She she gave the information she had. She's been not forthcoming with other things, but she was here. Um, I think that's that would be around the value that they are now to go sell those. I don't I don't know how that works. He might know. Oh, he does. But he he's not sharing. So the um, <laughs> all the vehicles over the he's time. The only guy in the room with a clue. <laughs> the Escalades, those are all leased vehicles. No. No. The Bentleys he paid cash for. Yeah, where's the Bentley now? I don't know how he I do, he does not have it anymore. He had two Bentleys, and I don't know how he returned them. I don't know if he got cash, and if he got cash, I never saw what that value was. How long ago did he dispose of those of those vehicles? Those would have been in, I believe, two thousand, approximately two thousand and eleven. Okay, so well before you guys separated. Yes. Yes. At the time of your separation, did he have any vehicles? That was yes, not, had, not that were not leased. He had the Escalade that was not leased, and he had his name was on my son's truck that was not leased, and his name is on my leased car. Okay. On the Escalade that was not leased, what happened with that? He sold that is it. A problem, same. Last August. <laughs> And your son still has a truck? No, his truck was repossessed. Because the payments weren't being made. Yes. Yeah, that's that's how it gets repossessed, Judge. <laughs> Glad you're on top of that. <laughs> it wasn't clear, but it sounded like the the house in Canterwood was repossessed. The cat, the house in Canterwood was. We call that foreclosure, Judge. But okay. The title was <laughs> given or taken over by Queen High Full House, an entity that Tom and Hin Um owned. That entity owned both of their our homes. I was told after the fact that Tom was paying $100 a month in rent for this home, and it was in the newspaper. I read about it. Um, that was against my knowledge that he did that. Um, and then when the bankruptcy happened, that Queen High Full House entity that was owned by Tom was, I believe, taken over by the trustee, and therefore those houses were sold and we were evicted. So it was the bankruptcy trustee who ultimately evicted you? I believe so. I, I believe that is true, yes. So you don't, you don't, you and your husband do not, at the time of your separation, did not have any interest in real estate. Not that I know of. No, I'm curious. The household goods, furniture, furnishings, and so on that you have in the in storage. Any ideas to what that's worth? At a fair, I guess at a garage sale, you decide to sell all this. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I have Tom's snowboard is in there. There's outdoor furniture. There's I I gave, I donated our three sofas. They were in the not very good condition. I donated them to the furniture bank and had to pay fifty dollars. But so I alleviated those to lift the cost of storage. It goes by weight. So those were gone. Um, there's some china cabinets and things and there's our furniture has been moved several times so i don't know how what the demand would be for that type of thing um i, I don't even have a guess give me a rough idea 
Because I have no idea. Obviously, I don't know how many things you've got there or anything. Okay. Because um, you're paying over two hundred dollars a month to key store it, right? Oh, six fifty-six. It goes by weight. It's sixteen thousand pounds. All right. So you're paying six hundred fifty-six dollars a month. Yes. Okay. Oh, sweet Jesus. For outdoor furniture, I mean, literally, it was probably nice stuff. It was expensive when it was purchased. It has no value now. Uh, I don't know what she's storing it for. Her her and her boyfriend who won't last don't don't need uh, don't need this, but okay. Maybe uh, $3,000 perhaps. Um Are you current on the storage payment? Yes. How long have you been paying that? The moving cost was um, the end of October, and I've been paying the storage payment November to current. Uh, so what is that, eight months? No, no, it's more than that. Ten, basically. All right, so you have paid $6,560 for furniture worth $3,000. Yeah, I'm paying, yeah. I suppose it would cost you more to replace it. Yes, it would. But, uh, that's, that's why I'd like to get it out and have it in the house. All right. <laughs> Does anybody owe you or your husband money as far as you know? Well, my husband owes me money. No, but I meant anybody owe you as a couple money. Oh, um, uh, we're, we're really not there. That's that's kind of what this whole hearing is about. Oh, that's more obnoxious than she appreciates when when it comes out of her mouth. You know, I I, I don't know that. Um, I don't know. Right. You mentioned. I think you said there was life insurance policy on his life at one point. Yes, he had a. a He's, he held three life insurance policies in a Price Family Trust, and I don't know the status of that. Okay. That would tell me. They've lapsed. Uh, I'll tell you the status right now. <laughs> he doesn't care. The kids are grown. All right. Sorry. What about this Price Family Trust? <laughs> Who established that and so on? Um, I believe Tom and his dad did. And do you know any, any assets that were moved into that? trust um no i don't i don't so you have no idea if it's worth anything or a lot of, or a lot i don't know i i know that it's at kitsap bank and i do know in discovery there was a check written to it from his dad a, a Chase Bank check written into it, I believe in 19. Don't recall the amount. He wrote, he wrote the check in in somewhere 20 years? Sometime in 2019. Oh, okay. Sorry. What was it? You may not recall the amount exactly, but have you got some idea? Was it $100,000 or more? Oh. Or no, it wasn't. It was less than that. Um, Ten thousand dollars or so, or, or one thousand, or what? It was more than one thousand, less than ten thousand. Yeah. I don't recall, but I do recall Tom, Tom telling me when his dad died, he would be the executor of the trust, and he would make give payments of whatever money would go to his sister who doesn't work. I don't know the amount of payment. But that's just what he told me. Right. <laughs> I think that's about right. Can you think of any other thing of value that you, uh, you and your husband had? Well, we had we had a boat that he traded against my knowledge in 2007. That's a while ago, but. Yeah, but that, oh, she's still bitter about the boat. 
<laughs> from 2007. Oh, sweet Jesus. I didn't see all of this. At the time of your separation that either one of you still have. Um, You'll see. Well, he took his jewelry and watches. I, I kept mine. Um, he said he didn't want any of the furniture. You can have it all. He didn't want family pictures or anything. He just took his clothes and left. And um, yeah, it's, it's possible he has another vehicle, but I don't know. I don't know. can say. You were, uh, there was an issue here about like points on your credit card, the American Express, like traveler's points. Yes. You, have, you have no idea. Yeah. Meanwhile, he's got another boat in Ibiza <laughs> filled with a bunch of hoochies. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is too funny. How much those, how many points you got? <laughs> or what well, according to the American Express book, it looked like there was a million points that he went through. When you say he went through them, he's he expended them on um, getting free trips or something. Or, or upgrades. Like, his yes, travels, upgrades, yes. Is there anything left? You know, I would like to know that. Only he knows that. I, I, I don't know. Life's all about right there. <laughs> and there was also an issue about capital loss carry forwards. Do you have any yeah. idea how much, how much you've got in capital loss carry forwards? Yep. I mean, Miss, Mr. Robinson knows because he took it off the documents. I'm I'm not good at that type of stuff, and I'm going to have to get better at it and learn it, but I, I can't recall what it was for. I'm sorry. Damn it. This case is not funny, but after a couple cocktails and my chat gets going, I can't behave myself. All right. So if the court orders Mr. Um, Price to pay spousal maintenance and he doesn't do it, what are you going to do? Well, I don't know. I'm in a, I don't know. I'm going to, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I hope he does. He said he would. Um, then all of this happened and I would hope that he would stay true to his word. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't, what do I do, your honor? That's what I'm asking. Have you thought about that? place where I can be me. I haven't thought about it. I'm on, I'm on one day at a time. I Every time he's has a new order from, a, from Commissioner Farmer or from someone else, I just hope and pray that he'll, he'll follow through with that after our 30 year marriage together and raising three kids. Well, let's say the court orders some amount of spells. Okay. You raise the kids. He, he provided for them. I don't know if it was fraudulently or, or for real. I literally don't know. You'll see that you you won't find out. But now it's time to take care of yourself. You, you've had a good life. You sip lots of uh, Cristal on the yacht. But it's over. It's over. Maintenance, it's enough for you to live on. If he dies tomorrow, you got the same problem too, don't you? Well, I would like him to um, yep. have a life insurance policy covering that amount until he could pay it off. He did say at one point he would pay pay something off in the future at a discounted rate to me. I don't know what that means. He said that when he said that he would pay the the maintenance off and ask and. I would have to give him a discount. He would pay it off in full. Yeah. Kind Nailed of like it. a business Nailed deal. It. Nailed it. Oh, I got you. He wants to take an annuity and bring it back to present value. I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. I think so. Um, if I remember right, that that carry lost forward. I do. I believe it was $18 million. Jeff, you might have that. In order for you to use that, don't you have to be able to generate capital uh, capital gains to offset them against? I'm not sure. I would have to consult my tax attorney, Matt Stanley, and confirm with that. Mm -hmm. But I don't know the answer to that. That's wrong. 
and I'm offended. I guess what I'm saying is I'm not sure you can actually use them. I don't know if you could. I don't. I don't know. I'm not sure they're sellable to anybody else. I don't think. I think they have to be personal to you. Uh, corporations can sometimes sell them because they can change you. ownership. And the corporation continues to exist, but there's different owners for it, so they can kind of get away with that. But I'm not sure if individuals can. I don't know. But of course, then what you do is you sell it to a company that's already got a lot of capital gains or expects to have them. So they have, so it's worth it to them. Well, all right. I've got no other questions. Mr. Robinson, anything further? No, other than um, if you'd like to know, Ms. Hussey estimated the carry forward loss to be 3.4 million in the report. Um, we don't have any uh, personal, we don't have any knowledge. These are. We've, we've never received anything relative to that. Um, yeah, I think if you get a breakdown of the detail on the tax return, the tax return has to show the history of the capital loss, and then it has to show, you don't necessarily see that this is just sort of usually background information, but that usually shows a the declining balance as because you know as you use it against gains, it gets, it gets reduced. And uh, so, in the detailed stuff that I'm not sure necessarily has to be filed, but usually the detailed stuff that the accountant uses to calculate <laughs> that, which goes into the final return, which the end the end does. It shows how much you're taking. Uh, it's going to show a declining balance because usually most of us couldn't take that kind of a loss and carry it, have to carry it forward because you can't take it all in one year because you don't have enough capital gains to do that again. So would you do it over a period of years? Well, anyway, okay. Any other questions though for Ms. Price? Uh, none for me. Any cross-examination, Mr. Oh, good Lord. No, no, not, nothing further from respondent. Okay. You wanted to do something about the exhibits, uh, Mr. Robinson? With your permission, Your Honor, I just want to go through and make sure what has been admitted because um, I haven't. I'm I think you got a copy of an exhibit record this morning from Mrs. Winnie. Yes. And all the deals that are marked Y are admitted. Yes. There may um, have been some changes this afternoon for the few others we've added. I have. Um, let's see. Is there a particular one you have an issue or question about? Because sometimes, sometimes I track it a little differently than Mrs. Winnie does. She's usually better better at this than I am, but I occasionally will get a exhibit that I know is admitted that she somehow didn't. It shows up in my notes. Uh, We're now at about three fifty. Do you want to take the evening to go through this, and then refresh, address it in the morning, and do closings then? That would that would be fine. Okay. Works for everybody. Uh, I indicated previously I wouldn't let Mr. Nelson put on any affirmative uh, testimony, but at least I'll ask him what he wants to do at this point. Now that subject to subject to the confirmation of all the exhibits, the petitioner rests. And and I think it was a little difficult to hear everything the court just said, um, but I do understand that the petitioner rests. Um, is the court offering that I might call I'm Mr. Asking Price? What, I'm asking what you want to do. You want to call Mr. Price? Yes. You got anybody else you want to call? Um, that would be a no. Well, uh, a little unprepared for this question, as, as the court had, had ruled twice that right. Price. But I, I'm. Um, I would like to put Mr. Price know. on, and potentially Mr. Hansen, the CPA. All right. So the, we get into a big discussion here. It's actually interesting, a little nerdy, but <clears throat> the problem is he wants to call his client to testify, but his tie, his client has not cooperated, and as a sanction, is not allowed to testify. That's what we're going through right now. All right. Well, we'll talk about that tomorrow. I guess, Mr. Robinson, in the meantime, figure out what exhibits you want to confirm, and then we'll do that. And I, uh, I found the one uh, that I was concerned about. It was the invoice 
for uh, Exhibit 109, the invoice for uh, Ms. Hussey, and I thought that I had offered it and you accepted it. I do have 109 being offered and admitted without objection. I, I don't know, but I, I suspect the guy with the pile of cash is... Uh, this is when he'll change that. ...found that something saying. younger and more interesting. Just a guess. And that was done... I don't, I don't know. On... Just a supposition. <laughs> Tuesday, August 11. Wait, I think so, anyway. So that was the only um, the only exhibit I had noted that on my sheet was admitted that I didn't see here. Yes, I have Tuesday, August 11. Was that 313? At 313. She added in her trial notes, but she didn't get it on the exhibit record. Oh, that's fine. Uh, I'm not concerned yeah. about it. Yeah, no, 109 is admitted. Anything else? No, you mean. Okay. Um, then we'll do closing arguments. I'm not I'm not necessarily anticipating any additional testimony from the respondent. But do you otherwise now rest? Is that right, Mr. Yes, sir. Officially? Okay. So I'll let you guys formulate what we ought to do, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. Thank you, Anna. Have a good evening. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Your Honor. Oh, oh wait, wait. We're going gonna, we're gonna to zoom about 9.15 again. We've got another case I, that's resuming. I thought about another inviting Deborah. That we sent over for a few weeks ago, so I can't do it uh, for her. We're going to be able to get to that a little later in the day. But that's, in that, in that case, they're uh, they're both here in person, right? She's she's in Zoom? They're in Zoom, too? Okay. I kept thinking Mr. Arigato is here. He came in that one time to drop that stuff by, but he isn't actually not it for the trial. Though. They're all set. Okay. So we'll see you tomorrow. And, and, and Your Honor, but before we conclude, just so I, I, I can make the best use of my time and be prepared tomorrow, mm -hmm. is the court uh, allowing Mr. Price to testify, considering that Mr. Price might testify, or confirming that Mr. Price shall not testify? I'm considering the possibility. Okay. Understood. Thank you. But, but I really do think that Some of the problems that you've indicated you want to get to, which is what is his current financial circumstances, so there's something a little more current than I don't know, middle of 2019, I guess, is kind of the best we've got there. Love it. Is this of his own making because he didn't provide the additional discovery? And that really puts Mr. Robinson in a bad spot because it's like, you know, he could say about anything he wants. And Mr. Robinson doesn't have the opportunity to back any of that up by having the discovery that says, wait a minute, here's what your bank statements say. That's not true. And given the volume of materials here that we've had to go through and the, and, and to turn us do all this, it does seem to me that it, that that he has put. Well, I, 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 I you know I don't like the fact that he doesn't have to that I'm not letting him testify. It rubs me the wrong way in terms of hey everybody should at least get their day in court kind of stuff. On the other hand, it gives him an opportunity to say pretty much anything he wants to say without being second guessed or discredited or contradicted. Judge is absolutely right. He he hasn't he hasn't participated in discovery. So then they're they're gonna go uh, scammer or not, whatever this guy is. And I don't know. I'm not making that judgment. He's more financially sophisticated than anybody else in the room. And and if it, his attorney gets to call him and they don't have any discovery material, he'll just say whatever the hell he wants, and they don't have anything to cross him on. It's absolutely unfair. You would get barred from testifying. Uh, in, you certainly wouldn't Cook County. I guarantee it. And that's because of his failure to participate in the discovery process, which I regarded as completely willful. And so, you know, so I'm not real sympathetic to this, which is what I've indicated all along. And uh, but I, reg I regret having to get to that point because I do I would have otherwise, of course, wanted to hear what Mr. Price had to say about all that. And because his current income is, of course, ordinarily of tremendous consequence. Um, so that's where we are. But at the moment, and I'm, I'm not, you're going to have to do something to persuade me that whatever you're proposing to offer as evidence, maybe as an offer of proof, you might want to make that. But it's not going to necessarily be something that the discovery violations would have much to do with. And I'm well, not sure any way you can do that. 
and by way of a, a brief and, and kind of introductory offer of proof, proof I'll, I'll re restate what I said uh, when we had arguments about this before the trial started. It said as soon. All right, an offer of proof is you're going to give the judge some idea of what testimony you're going to elicit so that they can make a more informed decision on whether or not they're going to allow it. As soon as I got on board, I retrieved uh, from from Ms. Hansen updated financial statements and bank statements, and I believe credit card statements as well, for RCF, Claire, and Sparin. Upon receipt of those, I filed them under seal, and, and the court will see that you know, I, I got them out to everybody as soon as I got them, not arguing that that was well behind what was required under the orders to compel, but, you know, I... I Attorney's doing a really nice job here. He's saying, my, my client's completely not in compliance, I understand that, but I'm new to it, and I did the best I could, which is a really slick, slick and appropriate argument to make. Uh, it's the best you can do. So he's doing nice work with shit facts. I, I did what I could do to kind of move things along. So the documents that I would offer are updated financial statements for these three companies. The stuff Everybody's you, had them for a couple the, weeks now. The stuff you've submitted under seal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and, that it, and that have already been marked as exhibits. Um, and I think that we might have to local. talk about how they've been Love marked because we now have some some um, numbers that overlap so we would just need to clarify that these would be respondents 101 through 107 mm -hmm. and again the offer of proof that I'm making is that they will shed some light on what these three corporations have generated yes it will shed the exact light that that your client wants it to shed after he's funneled all the money he can into crypto the Caymans and a Swiss bank account Mm hmm <laughs> and we all know it up to year to date i think i've got through june of 20. okay all right we'll talk to you guys tomorrow thanks okay thanks judge have a good night you got a better argument for a new argument for me mr nelson about uh, uh need to put some some kind of case on i'm sorry your honor you broke up there at the very end of your statement sure do you have any New or better argument that I that I should allow you to present some evidence. Well, again, um, let, me, let me lay this out in in the terms that I've set forth before. One, I think the court has to take evidence, or you would not be able to make findings necessary under twenty six oh nine oh eight oh and oh nine oh. I'll stay strong. Uh, <laughs> all the case law that talks about these statutes require the court to look at things at the time. <laughs> Of dissolution and thus far all the evidence that has been uh, uh, entered relates back to 2017 and 2018 with regard to assets and income of the parties so just as an evidentiary matter I believe the court has to uh, put some more current evidence on second the court will recall that bench warrants have been issued in this case at various times and uh, one is currently outstanding. Now, I understand that this isn't necessarily a motion to quash, but it certainly is Mr. Price's day in court to address whether or not those bench warrants will stand, or perhaps the financial circumstances are such that they should be recalled. Um, I provided case law in my motion to reconsider, citing that when someone is faced with involuntary incarceration, the denial of uh, the opportunity for them to put on evidence in their defense is a denial of, of 14th Amendment due process rights. So that, that's certainly a unique argument to make within a dissolution case, but, but we don't typically have this fact set in front of us wherein Mr. Price is facing involuntary in incarceration based on the outstanding bench warrants have you ever had a failure to appear possibly um finally i think just a matter of fundamental fairness requires that mr price put his evidence on we went through the burnett factors and i understand that the court and, and mr robinson 
I should say Mr. Robinson made various arguments about the Burnett factors, and the court made various findings about it. But nonetheless, I, I don't know that the record actually contains a specific finding of prejudice. I have not yet heard that document X was missing, therefore um, a, 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 a discovery sanction was appropriate, and the discovery sanction of not allowing evidence would be the least uh, strenuous sanction and, and therefore would be appropriate here. I so Burnett factors so based on here. statutory issues, based on the due process issues, <laughs> and based on uh, the Burnett issues, I ask that you allow uh, Mr. Price to put evidence on today. Mr. Robinson. Well, as far as the statutory criteria, uh, this is uh, of Mr. Price's making. Uh, the ability to obtain current information has been hindered and thwarted and obstructed to by Mr. Price's failure to provide this information with multiple opportunities to do so. Um, when the court doesn't have this information and uh, oh. is posed to the it court and the opposing counsel two weeks before trial, um, it is virtually impossible to determine whether it's accurate or truthful and or uh, complete. The issue of Mr. Price's credibility is very important in this case, and I believe it's been shown that Mr. Price is not a truthful person. He has um, not provided all the documentation that he was required to provide um, under the dis discovery that was outstanding and request for supplementation. And um, with all due respect to Mr. Nelson, uh, the file is replete with his failures to provide documentation. Um, we just found out uh, about a new bank account, a Parag or actually multiple bank accounts. There's a Paragon bank account, there's a, a, a French Societe Generale, and then there's a I U.S. bank know. account. Um, we don't have American Express statements. We've had to subpoena those who never provided uh, accurate and complete American Express statements. We've had to subpoena the records from Radiance, it required a ruling from either, I can't remember whether it was Judge Spear or Commissioner Farmer, that said, you are so close to this uh, business, it is uh, inappropriate yep. to require um, Mr. Robinson to have to go through all these hoops to get the records. And Mr. Sweeney, that was a result of Mr. Sweeney, attorney for Radiance, uh, objecting to our getting bank records. Um, every time we had to get something, it was a struggle and obstruction, and we still don't have everything. And in my closing, I'm going to talk about that. As far as due process goes, I don't know if you want me to address that or not, but um, there is no motion to quash the warrant. I will point out that the initial warrant was issued. Mr. Pro By the way, I'm making fun of both of these attorneys, but they're both doing a damn fine job. Uh, they're, they're making the arguments they should be making. I flagrantly um, disobeyed the order to report. Uh, in his own declaration, he had asked Commissioner Farmer to delay it because he was overseas and was unavailable and would report, I believe, he said in his declaration July 7th or July 8th of uh, 2019. Uh, obviously, he didn't, but we know for a fact that he was in Tacoma, Washington during the 90 days approximately that that warrant was outstanding. And then miraculously, he came up with $39,000 in a loan from his mother, allegedly, to uh, pay most of the outstanding uh, spousal support. Um, in order to enforce a court order, uh, there have to be penalties and consequences. And Mr. Price should not be given the opportunity to flagrantly uh, fail to follow court orders, basically thumb his nose at every judicial officer who's been involved in this case, refuse to um, uh, uh, properly uh, follow uh, property issues by selling the Escalade and cutting her off from medical insurance, which is strictly forbidden, and then coming before you saying, well, I have the right to put on my case and I have due process. I shouldn't have to be subject to jail. The analogy that I think is most appropriate is when his father finally got caught with uh, a judgment for unpaid support and was sitting in jail, the money came. So um, as this court has said in cases I've had with it, as well as other judicial officers, uh, this is uh, an attempt to, the, the, the penalty is an attempt to get compliance. 
And Mr. Price will never comply uh, with any court order unless there is the effective threat of him being incarcerated. You asked my client that question yesterday, and, and you know, when you asked it, what happens if he doesn't pay? You know, we'll talk about that in closing, but that that is the the question. He has been cruel. Um, he's been intransigent. He's been vindictive, and he's been uh, disrespectful. Uh, and uh, I don't think he deserves any courtesies at this Ooh. point. Um, and I would ask that you deny Mr. Nelson's opportunity, request for an opportunity. Do you want a last word? Sure. Um, I think really what, what I hear uh, Mr. Robinson argue somewhat indirectly is, is that the court should undergo a new balancing. Um, and, and what I'm hearing is that credibility is an issue his opportunity to vet the materials that have been recently provided are at issue. Uh, his ability to investigate or supplement uh, documents that he might need are at issue. Well, at least John the and, Ginger. And if we take this yeah. back to where this all started by way of the Burnett factors, I, I think that I hear him saying that a continuance might be the more appropriate remedy uh, rather than striking Mr. Uh, Price's ability to to uh, put on evidence in this case. Um, a continuance certainly would remedy everything that Mr. Robinson has argued um, and, and provides the court a mechanism to enter a judgment in this case that comports with state law under Title 26. Well, I recall offering um, the parties here a continuance at the outset of this. And nobody wanted one. That that is correct, Your Honor. So, yeah, you know, I know. So here I am. Um, it's of course it's the usual thing. I I I I, I fouled this thing up. I trusted you guys. <laughs> well, anyway, um, I guess I would say this. I mean, I, I ordinarily, if someone wants to, I like that. Y'all are a holes. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> quash a warrant or otherwise deal with um, the fact that a warrant is outstanding, you have to at least appear in front of the court to do so. And, of course, Mr. Price has not appeared. He is in a remote location. I have no idea where he is, even now. Uh, and we've had him on uh, our Zoom screen here for... Oh, that blows me away. He does not know where Mr. Price is as, as we speak uh, during Zoom. But I have a strong suspicion he's he's not... He's in a country that doesn't have an extradition treaty. That, that's what I think he is, because because he's because that would be the wise thing to do. And he, he he seems to know enough to keep his mouth shut. So I think he knows enough to do that as well. Sometime over the last uh, week, um, and so I don't know. Uh, but but there certainly has been evidence that there's information missing there's certainly been a vast array of things here there's been it does seem like there has been a, a calculated attempt maybe i'm just hearing the mr uh, uh, robinson and mrs price's view of this thing but it does seem to be a calculated attempt by mr price to keep other people uh, at arm's length with respect to his business dealings ah. that, he can, that he controls his you the finances that out. of these various yeah. organizations that even <laughs> somebody like Mr. LaCrosse, who is the nominal owner of the company he's working for, seems to have no ability to control what he's doing uh, to the point of frustration and selling the business. Um, I don't know why he couldn't have simply fired Mr. Price, but somehow that never crossed his mind. Um, maybe he felt like the whole business would collapse without him. Uh, and maybe that's true. Mr. Price seems to be very good at some of the things he's doing for sure. But he's also engaged in a calculated, it seems, effort to, as I say, distance himself from people who are interested in his business affairs, and certainly from creditors. There there may well be millions of dollars in judgments that are non-discharged in bankruptcy that he does not want people to get to. And so he's structured things the way he's structured things. Um, but even before all that, I mean, he, as I understood it, he's, he structured it so that his Homes were owned by a corporation so that he wouldn't actually have anything personally in his own name, it looks like. And during the course of all this, with, with 
tens of thousands of dollars per month being expended, there's really nothing to show for in terms of ownership of everything. Everything is leased or rented. You know, home, you know, even even you know, even meals are purchased. You know, all the traveling and stuff. Cars are rented. Um, homes are rented. It doesn't seem to be in any way of a, a significant thing in terms of what we can find in terms of retirement benefits or some kind of assets like that. And yet there's been vast numbers of amounts of money. And so it would have been useful to have more information about all this stuff just to sort of tell the truth of this. Um, and uh, But this is the best we could do given the information we've got and nobody wanting to continue us. Um, I'm still satisfied that, you know, Mr. Price has done at least some of the things that have been accused of. I mean, some of the stuff, because I'm sure, was done for legitimate business purposes, too. But it also seems like it was a way to evade uh, payment of income taxes as well. If he's having a business that's paid for travel, routine travel, for, for personal travel, for, for routine uh, personal items, well, duh. then he doesn't declare it as income, he doesn't pay. I like how Mr. Price is sitting there like, yeah, that what, what the judge is saying, that, that seems about right. The income taxes on it. <laughs> uh, the businesses have a deduction, so they don't pay taxes on it. And uh, there is some evidence in the case of the Internal Revenue Service is now auditing some of this. And I guess maybe there's a, maybe they'll figure out where some of this lies, but uh, Doubt it. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know that at this point in time I'm going to get any better information, frankly. Uh, and I do think that there is some consequences for Mr. Price putting us in this position by his failure to cooperate with this litigation. So I guess I'll adhere to my prior ruling, and there wasn't any alternative to this. Mr. Price wasn't going to be persuaded by the threat of jail with warrants for his arrest. He wasn't going to be persuaded by requirements to pay more money because he was already not paying his spousal maintenance. So I didn't see where there's anything else to do but this, frankly. So here we are. All right, so I did want to give at least one more opportunity to see if there was some better or different information that might be persuasive here, because it does rub me the wrong way, and I think I mentioned that yesterday, that Mr. Price thought have at least some opportunity to say what he has to say about this, but I think he's made that bad, and I don't like it, but here we are. So, closing argument. May I begin? Proceed. Um, well, Your Honor, we've been in this trial now for about uh, seven, eight days, and you've heard a lot of testimony concerning the issues in this case. But what it boils down to is um, really the introduction uh, in my trial brief. Um, I think we've established without any question that Mr. Price is the brains, the brawn, and the motivation behind each and every uh, business enterprise, along with his um, Butch Cassidy and Sundance partner in um, they have uh, perpetrated uh, through uh, various machinations the ability to uh, carry on a lifestyle that was consistent with the lifestyle that they've always carried on, joyfully and gleefully using innocent uh, people such as Ed LaCrosse, Patty Price, investors, um, using their money to generate income. This is, I, I think, uh... I disagree with the argument he makes here. I think he's a sharp guy, but I think I disagree with the tact he takes. He basically says this guy's uh, a fraudulent scumbag and then turns around and says, but I, I'd like my cut of that fraud, please. Come for themselves and um, depriving the people who rightly deserve that money. But um, this is about Patty Price. Um, I've lived this case since the onset, and as she testified, I'm basically working for nothing. Um, I have worked for nothing for probably a year and a half. And the reason for that is because she's a good. The reason for that is you, 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 if they find some money that you can get out of it, you'll take your, your, your attorney's fees out of that. That's what you're hoping for. I'm not knocking it, but let's, let's not act like your mother Teresa here. Person, an honest person. And um, she wouldn't have anybody if it wasn't for me. Nobody would help her. And I, I had to help her. Um, when I saw the injustice and the, the harm, oh please, the You're not putting this kind of uh, lot of things, uh, I couldn't protect her totally from that. But in essence, what we have is uh, a marriage of over a relationship of approximately 32, 33 years, and a marriage of over 30 years, and we have nothing. 
we have a woman who's do devoted herself um, without question to, uh, and blindly and, and basically naively, and she knows that now, uh, to support her husband and live a life that she thought was a good life. You know, you, you yeah, get married, right. you have children, you have success, um, and then you retire and go off into the sunset. And that's what Tom Price promised Patty Price uh, over and over and over again. Uh, I'll take care of you for the rest of your life. Um, and, you know, what's, what's interesting is that he, his uh, approach to convincing Patty that this was the truth was evident in the way he uh, carried on his relationship with her. He showered her in gifts and jewelry and uh, lavish homes and toys and uh, boats and cars and nothing but the best. And the travel was first class or business class. The hotels were five star or more. The meals were at uh, significantly expensive restaurants. The wine was uh, beyond reach of most of us. Um, and we had an eight carat diamond ring and who knows what else there was uh, in jewelry. Um, this was showered upon her and she loved it and she enjoyed it. And did she fall into a false sense of security? Was she naive? Was she ignorant about this? Yes, uh, I mean, she has to admit that. But what she did was she trusted Mr. Price and that was a fundamental mistake and a fundamental mistake that anybody who trusts Mr. Price, ultimately they will get burned, they will get ruined, and he will go on and carry on in the manner to which he has been accustomed because he has absolutely no empathy and no sense of right or wrong uh, and no concern over the people he hurts. Um, he's hurt his children. He's put his son Carter into a position uh, wondering how college is going to be paid, although so far, he's paid it and said he would. And now we have um, approximately eight or nine months of unpaid spousal support, judgments for attorney's fees that, uh, you know, frankly, I don't remember Absolutely. my 42 years of practice that I've, I've had these kind of judgments for attorney's fees, um, still unpaid. Um, he uh, used Mr. Hurdlebrink to the, and, and hasn't paid him. And, Somehow, miraculously, he has given Mr. Nelson money, but, but nobody wants to talk about that, and nobody wants to talk about um, how much he got paid. But the, the fact is that if he got money to pay Mr. Nelson, this could have all been taken care of if he just paid what he had to pay, what the court ordered him to do, follow the court order. But no, he didn't do that. Um, the, the warrant bunch, for arrest in, but thank in, you. Uh, issued in by uh, Commissioner Farmer in uh, approximately July 2000, 2019 went unenforced despite the fact that he was in town in Tacoma gleefully playing at Radiance Capital, taking people's money, investing it, and making millions and millions of dollars. The fact that he was in control of Radiance Capital Financial is um, beyond question. Um, he was the one for to make all the decisions. He's the one who uh, found the investors. He's the one who uh, originated the pools. He's the one who um, made every decision. And the exhibit from Dana Hansen, uh, her emails, um, clearly show that everything was um, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Price, to the point where uh, nothing could be done, no, no decisions could be made as, as to salary, no decision could be made as to raises, no decision could be made to purchases, uh, no decision could be made as to um, changing a light bulb in the men's bathroom. And I'm not joking about that. That is literally an email in uh, the exhibit. Um, Mr. Price uh, ran this business as his own. He and Mr. Um, to the disrespect and disregard of uh, Mr. Um, Lacrosse, moved money from account to account, from entity to entity, whether it was Sparn and Claire, whether it was uh, pool number 12 to pool, I'm using as an example, pool number 12 to pool number 15, 15 to 18. It didn't matter whether it was from pool uh, 
X to Radiance Capital to pay overhead, whether it was Radiance Capital to fund salary at Claire Technologies, uh, whether it was Claire Technology lending money to Radiance or to Sparin, whether it was Sparin lending $400,000 to Radiance. All this was done, and the record is replete with evidence that Mr. Price I've used the term before, and I have to use it again, the puppeteer. He's the one who pulled the strings. He's the one who made the decision. He is the one who ran these businesses. And the court kind of stole my thunder a little bit when you were talking about, in your um, uh, opinion or rejection of the motion by Mr. Nelson, uh, as to um, Mr. Price uh, building a, uh, a sham or a wall as to his ownership to defraud uh, creditors to defraud his wife and to defraud anyone else but himself and his next best thing. Um, and that's exactly true. Uh, he intentionally and specifically kept everything out of his name so that um, it could not be ex executed against. He specifically and intentionally uh, held property of any degree in uh, LLCs or in other people's names. Uh, but he is the only one that reaped the reward. When you look at the money that was generated by a legitimate business such as Radiance Capital Financial, it makes you wonder why he just couldn't do this the right way. Why he couldn't follow a path that would be honest, forthright, and um, in conformance with the law. But I think that there's something uh, significantly wrong with Mr. You just called him a criminal repeatedly. And then he, and then you uh, then you ask the open-ended question, why can't this guy follow the law? Mr. Price and his inability to come to reason with what uh, should be done in accordance with the law and what should be done for his own personal benefit. And that greed and that attempt to uh, aggrandize and increase his wealth and, and uh, setting is all over the place. You read, <clears throat> you heard the, the testimony of Dana Hansen. She was very clear that the only person she dealt with in reference to any of these entities, sparring player and uh, um, RCF Absolutely. was Tom. Uh, you heard the testimony of Greg Beckel and all the emails. He didn't even know who Ed LaCrosse was. Uh, you heard the testimony of Ed LaCrosse, which was really sad in, in many ways, but I guess it is what it is, um, uh, who testified as to the deceptions that Mr. Hen and Mr. Price perpetrated upon him and the money that he lost and the situation that he is currently left in without anything. And then to go the next step and have them sell the business to uh, ostensibly Mr. Um, he must be uh, not in cons not concerned about judgments, uh, and then not pay it and results in a lawsuit in Pierce County brought by Mr. LaCrosse. It's just the cherry on the top with his disastrous uh, uh, route with them. He was betrayed by Hen Um, his mentor and hero, and he was betrayed by Tom Price, his friend and uh, business partner. And he was betrayed to the tune where he is now at the point of despair. And then we heard the testimony of Sarah Hussey. And Sarah's um, um, report and um, involvement in this case was um, significant to tie everything together. Because what we have with Sarah's um, report uh, is the, uh, the reality, as close as we can get to the reality, of what Tom Price was doing. Can Without we get through a hearing hiring about crazy names? Person I mean, just to one? review the records, <laughs> we would be thrashing. And that expense is still hanging over Ms. Price's head. And, and just so I don't forget, we're asking that you order Mr. Price to pay the value or the, the, the amount that Ms. Hussey's bill, um, which I believe is Exhibit 109, um, is because her uh, report traces the um, uh, behavior of Mr. Price and his use. And what she did in her report, uh, 
was put together charts and put together um, I believe it's the accountant um, it just evaluations with credit cards and bank statements and showed how Mr. Price has an annual income of approximately a gross annual income based upon what she could determine of a million dollars a year. That's before taxes, a million dollars a year. That's the lifestyle he led. Yet he tries to portray himself as this poor suffering individual who only makes $24,000. And, I, and, I, and I, I have to say that- Someone sounds jelly. I'm just saying. <laughs> That's just why it's coming off. The ultimate question is if Mr. Price is truly uh, unable to support himself and his girlfriend, why doesn't he do something about it? This segues into Barn and Claire because yeah, that has been where his um, focus and energies have lied. He goes from one to the next. And that crystallizes it for me. He's basically saying this guy, this guy's uh, uh, fraudulent criminal. However, she should, she should continue in the lifestyle that she's accustomed based upon this fraudulent crime, and he should go to jail. That's effectively the argument we have. It's, it's not, it's not uh, the best. Uh, uh, hot topic, and Sparin is his golden goose, and that exhibit um, where the picture, the dinner picture was. Um, I wish I had these numbers more handy, but, oh, number 16, uh, excuse me, number 15, the wine box, uh, said a, a billion dollars, I believe, or $2 billion. Mr. Price, in two, 2017, um, when he became deeply involved in this case, or in this business, although it started a couple of years earlier, was um, convinced that this business would be a billion dollar business or more. And he still does believe that because he wouldn't have worked for three years beyond that. Thank picture, you, Belinda. Um, continuing to foster and promote a business that has no assets, no viability, no profitability, and no future. It's in nonsensical. It's insane. And he is too shrewd, too smart, too manipulative, and too conscientious about making sure he's okay to um, continue down a, a delirious path of um, uh, failure. It, it's just not going to happen. And that was true when you, when you saw the uh, attempts by um, Mr. Price to um, have the uh, ownership in Sparin, um, uh, which was uh, exhibit um, I believe it was exhibits 111 and 112. Maybe I'm wrong with the numbers. Um, uh, excuse me, uh, 119, uh, I believe, was the, the authorization, Sparn LLC resolution and authorization 119. That was admitted. Um, Keep your voice up, Mr. Robertson. I'm sorry? Keep your voice up. Oh, yes, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the, the um, exhibit 119 shows that um, Mr. Price was trying to manipulate an ownership interest in um, the uh, Sparn LLC because they are the owners of the interest in Claire. Now, who knows what he's going to do to make sure that Mr. Lacrosse loses that interest. I'm sure he's got a plan up his sleeve. I'm sure he's working with other people to make Mr. Lacrosse a loser to the $650,000 that he put into Sparring, as well as the other investors, um, all very wealthy people. Um, but Ms. Hussey showed in her uh, report that he has uh, clearly in, uh, a sense of success in Claire and Sparring. And his attempts to shield himself from his wife and others is, um, is deplorable. Well, this is what you get when you hire a hussy. Um, it even goes to the point where he and Mr. Um uh, applied for um, uh, a PPP loan with the SBA uh, for um, uh, help, for government help. Well, he's defrauding the government and not paying taxes, 
while he's defrauding creditors in not uh, paying the amounts of, while he's defrauding his wife and uh, refusing to follow court orders, he has the chutzpah, that's my word, the gall, to um, make an application to the government to help his business. And the testimony by Ms. Hussey was clear that there are certain standards by which you would get um, a publication of a, um, an application. And uh, that would have been that he had a payroll of between 150, it, that the loan proceeds between 150 to 350,000 would require a payroll up to over 800,000 sure a month. Now, RCF, if RCF is failing, if RCF is not paying Mr. Price, if RCF is just a losing proposition, if not. what did he tell the federal government in April 2020, not more than four months ago, about the payroll and the basis for getting this money? So one, either he defrauded the government again and RCF filed a false request to the government, or he has lied to this court over and over again through declarations through attempts to uh, diminish his income so that uh, this court would say, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Price, I see that you're disadvantaged and we'll throw you another bone. He's had so many bones thrown to him during the course of this exactly. case that um, consequences need to flow. He has left Ms. Price, who's 58 years old, has, hasn't worked outside the home for 30 years uh, with nothing. He intentionally, maliciously, and violently cut her off from medical insurance. He still covers himself. He has medical insurance. Why would anybody do that? Why would, and no matter how angry you are at a spouse, no matter how much you feel you've been abused in a relationship, no matter how you would uh, feel about disliking someone during the divorce, how would you even contemplate taking someone off medical insurance when you know they have a medical condition, they're depressed, they're in counseling, and they have no place to live. How would you do that knowing that she was evicted from a rental and was living in a home that was only good for three months and not pay her the, the amount to pay rent? How would you do that? Real easily. She's shacking up with somebody else, Jeff. Get a clue. And then a good uh, allow her to go homeless while she's caring for your college age <laughs> son and she's trying to survive. How would you let uh, someone uh, go without the ability <laughs> yes, to I'm carry not. on and buy herself a meal at a restaurant or um, <laughs> go to uh, the supermarket and be able to buy something special for Seriously. herself because she has no money and to be humiliated to her friends, be humiliated to her friends that she has no money. Humiliated. She may have to find work for the first time in 30 years. It's humiliating. Money and they are looking out for her. She's very blessed to have people who care about her and see the value in her. Yeah, she can sponge off more value people. In her as a person. And she only can sponge off those people because what he provided in the past. But, okay. And I will tell you that that value is real. She is a one. By the way, he's hiding assets from the court. He, I, I don't think he's any cup of tea either. But but this this is just not working on me at all. Wonderful, kind, loving person. Um, and the, it's shown by the, the, the support that she gets from, from everyone that has tried to proper but it's not going to go on endlessly it's not going to go on forever she can't continue to live in her uh, friend's apartment she can't continue to not be able to have a car she can't continue not to pay car insurance or to have health insurance she can't continue to not work her entire life or do anything productive after her children are raised insurance. she can't oh, continue sorry. to have to ask for handouts whether these friends want to be repaid or not her morality, her sense of conscience is that she has to pay it back. Ever, ever? So what do we do? The case law, <laughs> in my opinion, is clear that in a long-term relationship, a long-term marriage, Rockwell and its, its pro progeny um, clearly establish a basis for lifetime spousal support. 
we have all the indices of, of that. We have uh, a woman approaching 60 years of age with no retirement, no uh, house, no assets. Yeah, not her. <laughs> and we have a man who has lived a lifestyle that, uh, according to Ms. Hussey, would um, generate a million dollars a year. I don't believe a word Mr. Uh, Price says um, in terms of what his status is. And I don't know how anybody can believe him because uh, he doesn't know how to tell the truth. But um, the one thing he did say as I opened my brief was in his declaration of October 23, 2018, we have no investments, retirements, or savings. We just have debt. And that debt um, is the only thing they have. So we're asking that you um, generate, uh, uh, that you order and you decree and you enter a, decree, a divorce decree that would provide um, for lifetime spousal support to Ms. Um, uh, Price in the monthly amount of $25,000 a month. Non-modifiable, obviously, because it's statutory. Your question to her yesterday was painful for me to hear and to listen yes. to. Um, we've, we've you said, what do I do? What do you do if he doesn't pay? There is no answer to that. Mr. Price will do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. And I hope he gets put into jail so that he can be forced to either pay or sit. Um, again, I've got money to pay Mr. Nelson. <laughs> Mr. Price is like, I don't care what you think, loser. <laughs> to find money to pay his wife. <clears throat> He's unaffected. We're asking that the um, Zero apps. carry forward loss since no it wouldn't hearing. be uh, appropriate for Mr. Price to have them. He has no capital gains. And, and you mentioned, and correctly, I believe, even though you know more about it than I do, that it would apply to that. If Ms. Price has an opportunity to use those carry forward uh, losses, they should go to her. Well, we're past that. We believe that there's an interest that Mr. Price will have in the entities. And we're asking that you enter an order that any interest he has, contingent or otherwise, in Claire Technologies, Sparn LLC, uh, Radiance Capital Financial, any Radiance Capital receivable pool, or any offshoot or um, um, uh, derivative of any of these businesses be awarded to uh, Ms. Price 100%. He should not get any of it. Oh, yeah. Um, He's got some good stuff lined up. He's had plenty uh, of time. That uh, <laughs> would be uh, logical. There's no doubt in my mind. Have him forfeit all the jewelry in his possession, whether it's $500 or $5,000 or $50,000, his watches, his rings, the monies that he's paid. He's admitted buying his girlfriend uh, $800 shoes and, and jewelry and stuff, that should all be surrendered and sold so that the money could be applied to his deficiency. Um, we're asking, because he said in his declaration on April 9th, 2019, he probably does. As I stated previously, if the court finds that I'm hiding anything, lying about assets, debts, income, et cetera, et cetera, then I will pay all attorney's fees incurred. I can promise, I can make that promise because I'm being truthful to the court about everything. I should be the one that awarded attorney's fees for having to respond. That was on page four of five of his declaration. I think there's uh -huh. beyond anyone's doubt that Mr. Price has uh, lied. Uh, about assets, debts, income, et cetera. I think that Mr. Price lied in his declaration where he said, I am being truthful to the court about everything because he has not. His own ad admission, he said, I will pay all attorney's fees incurred and we're asking you to order that all. The, the attorney's fees are really close to his heart. He, he, he says to his, to his uh, ex-wife or his wife, I guess, that he's going to pay attorney's fees. That's all Jeff's focused on, <laughs> and we all know why. All attorney's fees. It's not enforceable, Jeff. My office, Go back to law school. all costs for this trial. <laughs> 
be entered as a judgment against Mr. Price. At this point, it's uh, more than $150,000 that has been incurred for Ms. Price. That's a big hit for me, but I'm doing it. Um, but I'd like oh, that judgment sweet entered. Jesus. Wait, I'd I like the judgment it. entered from Ms. Hussey. And then parenthetically, I mentioned um, that Judge That's Spear good, had Jesus. awarded $25,000 in attorney's fees, but it was never rendered into a judgment. She allowed that that... Oh, sweet Jesus! What? <laughs> A permissible that's a big hit for me come on days and never did and i'm asking that a judgment be entered up non pro tongue to 60 days post the entry of that order and he's banking on finding a pool the, of cash um, order of judge spear um it may or may not work but he's not mother Teresa. He said uh, oh it, it, in addition we're asking that all prior judgments in this case not merge with any divorce decree and continue in full force and effect, and we're asking that the, that the finding of contempt and the bench warrant um, uh, continue in full force and effect, um, and that uh, when he is arrested, we will probably should have done that. collect uh, on his bond. Um, he said in his declaration of January 23, 2019, uh, drink white, open book, white cloth. you made Deal a point in your recent discussion. <laughs> Um, about that. Uh, That's what I, I think did. we can all agree that he's not an open book. He's not even open. He's a closed book. We've provided you over 21,000 pages of exhibits. I have to apologize for that, but I had to do that. And I can't even tell you the stress that we were under putting this together because when Mr. Nelson appeared, we were faced with a trial. We had no idea where Mr. Pr Mr. Price was living. We anticipated that we would put on formal proof, uh, so we had to scurry and put stuff together. Fortunately, we had our PR 904s together and everything, so it was just a matter of putting them in notebooks. But your judicial assistant deserves um, a lot of credit and uh, thanks from my office, and I know my... Don't worry, they didn't read it. You didn't prove anything up. Our legal really <laughs> appreciates everything Ms. Winnie has done, and I want to just say thank you to her to have to lug those darn notebooks. One thing I'd like to say is, could we get them back? Because we paid a lot of money for those notebooks and please don't throw them away. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but the, the fact of the matter is that those 21,000 21, pages that we had to provide to you um, showed that Mr. Price was not an open book. Every document virtually was subpoenaed from Never. Uh, entities such as Timberland Bank. Never. Um, Chase Bank. American Express. Bank of America. I try to keep it uh, under three Radiance bullet points. Capital, Five, ten Sparn, minutes max. You name it. Every document virtually. Because Mr. Price provided nothing of substance. And what he did provide was effectively useless because he would black out information. He didn't collate it. He didn't even give us all the information that was requested. He'd give accounts with just partial um, information. Um, and he never supplemented anything. And then we find out that there were other bank accounts and other entities. Uh, never provided Thank us anything you. about Select LLC, which is uh, evidently a viable LLC. Uh, if he has an interest in that, he should get it. Well, so he's not an open book. Here. He's Unless cost I Mike, so, uh, I can't. so much time, aggravation, and <laughs> I can't expense judge. that it's unconscionable. We're asking the court so to funny. do as requested. Uh, we're asking the court to recognize the harm and pain that Mr. Price has caused, and we're asking the courts to grant the relief that we have uh, set forth. Do you have any questions for me? Oh, sweet Jesus. You mentioned the, no, it's, it's select LLC? Yes, we found a select, and it was testified to S-I-L-E-C-T-E, -E. select LLC. Evidently, that is a subsidiary of Claire Technologies that Mr. Price is involved in. Mr. Price is like, I've got six entities between those two things, <laughs> but good luck, dummy. <laughs> Wasn't there also something called like Equity LLC? 
No, equity funding was a pool that Derek Edmonds um, formulated okay. with Mr. Price, and it was just for equity funding. There were no other investors in that. I have no other questions at this point, Mr. Nelson. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh-oh. The oh, rise and high. fall of the prices is a captivating and terrifically sad story. And, and I, I start my comments with that statement to highlight that this truly is the rise and fall of the prices. One of the themes that has come out over the last few days of testimony is that Ms. Price was an unwitting and unwilling participant in the, the financial decisions of this family. And that is absolutely an untenable and unbelievable position to take. We'll get more into that later. But the prices made a lot of money, incalculable amounts of money. And by the same token, they lost it all. I agree. It's incalculable because you, you, you haven't turned over the documents. <laughs> the bankruptcies. And now we see it's not that the numbers that are too big. We can figure that out. RC, uh, uh, RCF is in ruins. Um, and these investment companies on the East Coast, to the extent that we can tell anything about them, we certainly don't see that either of them are viable that or could profitable. Be. You're talking about Claire? Claire I have no Spar. idea of his actual financial situation. Um, again, Ms. Price is not an innocent party here. She presents uh, presented a trial as a very intelligent woman, college-educated woman. This feigned helplessness is, shouldn't be given any weight by the court. Throughout the party's marriage, she testified to being showered with gifts, cars, expensive wines, um, travel all over the world, and all of this occurring after she participated in the largest bankruptcy in the state of Washington, yet she doesn't ask any questions about it, or at least that's what she tells the court. However, uh, some of the things she said, and I'll touch on these later, undermine this helplessness position. The theme that I've advanced throughout this case on behalf of of uh, Mr. Price is that the court cannot decide the issues that it must decide solely on conjecture, hyperbole, and speculation. And as we just argued this morning, I said, this is, I mean, I, I, they both just have horrible facts and make horrible arguments, despite the fact that I think they're both decent attorneys, but they both just have terrible things to deal with. And he's saying they haven't proved up their case because they don't have any evidence, which is right. It's a very good thing. He's saying you can't just make this – you can't just pull these numbers out of the sky. They haven't proved squat. They haven't. But the reason they haven't is because your client is clearly uh, in, in contempt of court and, and not co cooperating with anything. But that's all the court has before it. Um, Ms. Husey's testimony, while thorough, interesting, is frankly stale. It's not helpful to the court to, to understand – what happened in the life of a venture capitalist uh, two years ago. Um, and that's all we've got from, from Ms. Husey. <laughs> the other evidence that uh, was put on was equally as unhelpful. Let's talk about Mr. Beckel's statements. At the end of the day, all we can really draw out of his comments are that he's somewhat dissatisfied with the investments he made with uh, RCF and, and the RCR pools, although he made some money on them. He, he, he testified that he didn't get some documents that he wanted and, and, that, and that somewhat annoyed him. And he testified that despite never having seen a document with Mr. Price's name on it, he believed that Mr. Price was the owner of this company. However, that's just not material to anything. What, what Mr. Beckel believed about the ownership of RCF or RCR uh, doesn't affect what this court needs to do. And, and it certainly didn't affect Mr. Beckel's returns on these various pools. I mean, he got what he got, whether or not the court established that 
Mr. Lacrosse was the owner. Mr. Price was the owner. Mr. Um was the owner. I mean, for the purposes of what we're doing here today, Mr. Beckel's comments are just and comments. They're not. They're not entirely helpful. And I, I argue that the same you know, rationale applies to things that Mr. Lacrosse told the court. Mr. Lacrosse, uh, and I agree with Mr. Robinson on this point. Um, Scott in the crossfire. He perhaps didn't exercise the diligence that he should have. I think he effectively testified to that. But at the end of the day, that was his fault and not Mr. Price's fault and not Mr. Um's fault. He was the owner, and, and it's not disputed. He has now sold that company, and that deal has gone sideways, and he's initiated a legal action against Mr. Um. I think what's, again, most important here is that, that legal action does not involve Mr. Price. And to the extent that there's some inference that he directed uh, RCAP in the past, such inference is now pretty stale in light of the fact that Lacrosse has sold the company to Um, and now the two of those folks are in litigation with each other. So again, I, I don't see how any of that helps the court determine what Mr. Price's income is for the purposes of this dissolution. So then we get to, to Ms. Husey. Um, I mean, she did a, a lot of work and I found her to be a, a, quite as good a credible chart. witness <laughs> and, and a well-prepared um, uh, expert for the court. However, her presentation was profoundly flawed. It was flawed to the extent that her analysis didn't proceed past 2018. Frankly, I think that was by design. Yeah. I think she certainly did have documents that went into 2019. Um, I believe she had the documents that went up through the end of quarter three, 2019, but she doesn't do any projections. She says, well, I only had complete documents up through 18, so I used those. Plus, and this isn't an opinion necessarily so much as it is an argument, but, but Ms. Husey states, people going through divorces tend to minimize their income once the divorce starts. This case started in 2018, therefore it's just not really helpful for me to provide information to the court about post-2018 income streams. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Again, that, that's contrary to state law. Um, and, and plus, in, in a case like this that is financially complex, with a lot of different players, a lot of different cash flow, and kind of financial conditions that no one is going to argue are a moving target, plus the largest pandemic uh, in the last hundred years, or I guess the only pandemic in the last hundred years, we... We're, we're left with a, a shiny, interesting, factually based um, they, analysis they it from Ms. Husey. It's online, simply two like, years old. About it. And to the extent that it's two years old, it's not helpful to the court. And it should be given very little weight. I want to touch on this issue of uh, the capital gains carry forward. And I, I think everyone got this right. Um, I looked into it as well, just to clarify, you, Iris. and I think it's it's not disputed that between the parties, there's about three point four million dollars uh, from the from the bankruptcies and the fall of Priam and things like that that would be available to either Mister or Miss Price by way of, of future um, capital gains offsets. However, I also think it's agreed that neither of them are going to have capital gains that they can offset this $3.4 million with in the foreseeable future. So what we have to deal with is the capital gains, or excuse me, capital loss carry forward limitation at IRC section oh, Jesus. 1211. Oh. And what that section provides is that you can use those carry forwards against ordinary income but it's limited to oh, $3,000 a year for an unmarried person or $1,500 like a year for, for a couple. 
And so what I would suggest is Isn't it the that, other way around? Isn't it the other way around? Could I, I have it backwards? <laughs> 3000 for a couple and 1500 for a single. His argument yeah, actually yes, makes sense, right. but it's so irrelevant. <laughs> um, so I would suggest, you know, kind of given what we know here, that guys, neither of them are going to use or $2. He's $2. hitting it all. It's There's no capital gains. Um, either way. valuable in their hands to the extent that each of them should be able to use $1,500 oh, a year Jesus. for the next, well, for their lifetime, frankly. Um, but that's all either of them are reason, reason, reasonably going to get out of that deduction. Exactly. So to the extent that there's an argument that it should be awarded completely to Miss Price, that simply just doesn't make any sense. Um, both of them can use it in an equal fashion. They should both yeah. be allowed to. Wait, wait. So I just now let's go to the 1031 They should award it equally, is that what you're suggesting? Yes, yeah. Like I said, I, I, don't, I don't think that... Awarding it all to one party or the other would, would render much of it unused. It would, We're gonna it would allocate never be depleted. The capital gains it's frankly never going to be depleted. That are never going to happen. <laughs> and and I, I believe the court did touch on that with Miss Husey, but I just wanted the to The judge is nodding to it as if it matters. Of, uh, closing oh, that it, sweet. You know, Jesus. those limitations exist at IRC 1211. Well, yeah, I, I, what I was talking about was the, the, there is certainly the limitations you're talking about. I'm not well, yeah. arguing about that. I was saying, but in order to really use it, but they have to be offset against capital gains. Yeah. And, and and I'm agreeing with that and, and I'm I'm submitting based on Oh my lord. Look at these nerds trying to act like they understand accounting, which they do to on some base level, but it's absolutely irrelevant. The I mean the horse is out of the barn. None of this matters in the least. <laughs> the facts of this case, based on the facts that there are some, you know, twenty three, twenty four million dollars in judgments against each of these two personally. I don't see how they ever have personal capital gains that they would be able to utilize these huge carry forwards. Were, were none of those debts, were none of those judgments discharged in bankruptcy? No, there's there's 20, I, you know, I, I guess I'll ask the court to take judicial notice of, of uh, the Spokane Rock One judgment against Priam the price is individually and the ums individually. It's it's 23 mil plus interest. It, I love it. It's uh, out of a King County. I want you to take judicial notice of the $23 million judgment against my client so he can't do anything. Of course, it's all moved offshore. It'll never be touched. Uh, no. Oh, the, the, the chutzpah on both sides and the position they're put in. I, th that's why this is fascinating to me. I, I don't know. I don't know. Superior court case, but the abstract is... Uh, recorded in links, so it, it's. But was it also not discharged in bank? It was not discharged. No, it was not discharged. It it is a a judgment uh, in favor of Spokane Rock One against the parties I identified. Well, do you know why it was non dischargeable? I no, I couldn't give the court a succinct answer on that. Usually, it's because of some misconduct by the debtor. And otherwise, debts are discharged. Yeah, it's a, it's a strong possibility that we have misconduct by the debtor, and, and here he is. The judge is all excited to show to show his knowledge of the bankruptcy code, which is admirable. But <laughs> unless there's some kind of misconduct, it's not getting us anywhere. And, and I and again, I, I don't have that answer for the court. I I just I just know that the two of them are. He knows damn well that there is misconduct by his client, but he's not going to disclose it in mid hearing, which which is appropriate. All of this is hilarious. Are faced with that, and for the purposes <laughs> of uh, you know what their future looks like, I, I don't see either of them in 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 the position to accumulate significant uh, assets that might generate capital gains. So moving on from there. Um, you know, there's this argument about the PPP loans. First of all, I think Ms. Husey got this wrong. Oh, shit. PPP, PPP? was uh, provided based on the <laughs> annualization of prior year's income. So to the extent that RCF made application to the uh, SBA for PPP, it was based on last Thank year's you. income, not this year's income. And Ms. Husey also failed to uh the ppp loan based upon last year's fraud scheme 
Oh, shit. It just keeps getting better. Uh, calculate into her numbers <laughs> that the PPP would have included premiums paid uh, for employee health care. So it was the payroll and the associated benefits. So this idea that the PPP application uh, represents some grand fraud against the court or against the government so they don't really have any basis the, the fact about the PPP loan is that whoever oh the whole program's a fraud but <laughs> we mean there's no basis but it's it's gone and it doesn't matter and there's not nothing collectible so he, he's wrong in theory but it, right in substance made that application and I don't recall if it was Mr. Price or some other employee of Radiance Capital Financial simply uh, applied for a benefit that was available to all small businesses in hopes that they might keep the doors open. It wasn't that they were <laughs> defrauding anyone. They were trying to save the sinking ship. It's an earnest man trying to trying to keep the Ponzi scheme going. Come on. Come on. And he, so he applied for a PPP loan like everybody else. And frankly that that's the more reasonable inference here. Actually, I don't know. And, he might have a legitimate um, business. You know, I, I point that out because I think Miss Miss Husey, despite her, her thoroughness in other sound. areas, didn't, didn't quite have that part of it right. So now let's talk about the law. Um, what does the court need to get to today in order to enter judgment that uh, comports with Title 26, 260990 and 260980. So let's start with 080 because I think that's the easier analysis. And the reason it's easy here is because the parties don't have assets. And 080 discusses the division of property and it requires it to at be least fair and equitable that they've at the time to the court. dissolution. Well, um, there's not really much the court can do here. I mean, we've talked about these uh, capital loss carry forwards. They should be divided equally. You know, each party's got um, jewelry and personal effects that are similar in value. Miss Price kept all the furniture. Mr. Price has got a few watches. Uh, there's just not anything that material could be divided up. We also learned yesterday that that um, Ms. Price has got some 932 shares of Microsoft stock. Um, you know, Your Honor, I, th I just want to object. That isn't the testimony. She testified 95 shares of Microsoft stock, not 932. I don't know where that number comes from. I think, I think it was nine, 93. Or 93. Okay. All right, I, I somehow had a, had a number off there in my notes, uh, and, and I'll, I'll, re, I'll rely on, on, on the court's representation that it's 93. In any event, um, I think it all goes to the point that despite all... My note, my note was 93 shares. I'm just Okay, I, I must have had an extra two in there somehow. I, and I, I could have gotten it wrong, too. Yeah. Um, well, well, that... In, you know, in, that in any matter. event... Um, it does change it by a factor of 10. We're, Despite we're off, the significant there, assets, <laughs> personal property, vehicles, and real estate owned or controlled by these parties during their marriage, they just simply don't have anything to divide anymore. And the most reasonable um, answer as here as is you know, that Judge. everybody keeps what they've got and that uh, each party would be able to utilize the capital loss carry forwards to the extent they've got a use for it. I think that, that's really easy for the courts to, to reconcile there. Now, maintenance. Let's get into the hodgepot. Maintenance in Washington State requires findings on a number of factors that are set forth at 2609-090. Um, Ms. Price and Mr. Robinson really haven't made any presentation to the court about whether or not those, those factors have been met. They're making more of an equitable argument. They're saying, Tom's a bad guy. They used to make a lot of money. We don't know what he makes now. Therefore, Patty should get 25 grand a month for the rest of her life. That is rock solid. That is his best argument. He just summed it up right there. That is correct. They have no freaking evidence. And they're just saying he's a bad dude. She should get 25K. 
I guess based on the proceeds of his um, ill-gotten gain. And and that is a strong argument. As much as I'm having fun with this, he really does hit it there. And and I get that argument. I mean, I think that all of us would, would like to to do that, right? I mean, there, there, there's a certain equity and a certain appeal to, to doing something like that. I, I'm going to write a wrong. That's what Mr. Robinson's argument. Judge, you can write this wrong. Tom is a bad guy. He needs to go to jail and pay the money. But that ignores what the law is. It flat out ignores what the law is. He's right. This isn't uh, an equitable decision. This is a statutory decision. That's really, really important here because the statutory factors haven't been met. We don't, we don't have evidence in the record sufficient uh, for the court to weigh this and grant the relief that Ms. Price is seeking. So uh, let's look at the factors. Let's break it down. The first factor is financial resources of the party seeking maintenance. Um, there's really no detail as to what she's got um, other than she just says, I got nothing. Um, but she didn't talk about the ability to get a job, the ability to go to school. She didn't talk about what her uh, um, live-in boyfriend is providing for her. She didn't talk about what friends and family are providing for her. She gave the court little to work with other than just kind of a general denial that she has anything. And I submit that that's not enough for the court to work with. Second factor, we've got the same problem with. The time necessary to acquire sufficient education or training, we heard that nothing about that's that. That's the problem right she there. She just simply said, I don't know why I haven't tried to get a job. Um, and then, you know, I, I literally her, her don't know his decision. Well, Tom, I'm walking it with you at this point. Uh, Tom said he was going to give me money. Therefore, I don't feel like I need to kind of participate in my own uh, financial It's only six future. more hours. But we have no evidence by which to address what she really needs to, to pull herself out of the financial mess that the prices are currently in. Now, fact to see, the standard of living established during marriage is met in spades. It is uncontroverted that these folks lived a lavish, extravagant lifestyle. But the flip side of that is this. It is uncontroverted that the money they spent was unsustainable. Their lifestyle is unmaintainable. They had it and they lost it all. In fact, they lost it all twice, um, which is all the more interesting, but it's true. The Priam bankruptcy, largest in the state, and now the fall of RCF, Claire, and Sparin. They've been on this roller coaster that's gone way up and it's gone way down. And they rode it to the top after the bankruptcy. As far as the court knows. And now they're down at the bottom again. Um, so despite the, the overwhelming evidence about the standard of living, the court should conclude that that standard of living doesn't dictate what spousal maintenance might be set at in this case. Uh, the dur duration of the marriage is undisputed. This is a long-term marriage. Uh, the age, physical, emotional condition, and financial obligation of the spouse seeking maintenance. Don't you know, worry. Again, this very, very represented you detail. There probably. was testimony about some counseling. There was testimony about some hormone treatments. Um, there was testimony about a lot of alcohol use. But... We didn't really get details about any of this. We didn't hear from a doctor. I like that. that that's just the stray. She's crazy right there. The, the hormone and alcohol stuff, which I'm sure is true, but that, that's what it is. And we all know it. We didn't hear from a vocational uh, assessment provider. We didn't hear from a counselor. Just kind of these inferences that um, I'm not in, in the best shape. But frankly, I don't know how the court would determine whether or not her, her current condition is typical for someone her age or atypical for someone her age. Those facts just simply aren't before the court at this point. And then we get to really what what is the, the big deal here, which is the ability of Mr. Price to pay spousal maintenance. 
Well, uh, Mr. Robinson argued that Ms. Price has offered 21,000 pages of exhibits, and I, I guess that's right. I've got them sitting in boxes around here. But not one of those pages tells us what Mr. Price makes in the year 2020. Not one of those documents informs the court as to what he might make next year or the year after that. Um, it doesn't even, nothing even really tells the court what he made in the year 2018 when this case started. Neither party has offered so much as a tax return in this case. And, and it is telling, in fact it is damning, that Ms. Price didn't offer a tax return. If the court would see 2017, 2018, and 2019 tax returns, I think it would completely blow up this theory that, that Mr. Price is, is somehow raking in the bucks or, or about to rake in the bucks. It's just simply not the case. But again, the problem is that then why didn't you offer it? Oh my God, don't make that argument. Stop now. This. It's not in the record. We don't know what he makes. Um, and, and, we, and we do know this, Washington cases, both divorce cases and, and civil litigation cases say repeatedly that a judgment cannot be based on mere conjecture. And that's all we've got here. Good argument. The only thing we've got is, is Ms. Price saying, I, I, I believe he can make money, and we've got uh, Miss Hussey's flawed analysis of, of oh, what might Hussey. exist Thank um, God we've got in the future Hussey. for Mr. Price. But again, flawed analysis <laughs> in so much that it doesn't deal with the present. I, I don't know how the court does this, frankly, and, I, and I'm a broken record at this point. Uh, I understand the argument that... So Wait, well, what, well, what amount of maintenance should I set? None or a thousand a month or what do you got? What's your proposal? Um, well, l let me get to my proposal in a minute because I, I let me just finish up with a few things and I do Thank have you. some proposals I want to. I well, you, meant, you mentioned being a broken record. I was just trying to push the needle a little bit. Okay, <laughs> and, and I will. I'm, I'm going to move on. Go ahead. Um, I, I want to touch on. What are you asking for? You know, Thank I, you, I, I want to touch on this idea that Mrs. Price is a victim here, and and. You want to touch on Miss Hussey? I think I've made my point that this is kind of a common stick my hand head in the sand routine that oh, that we've seen, Lord. and you know you've seen Speak your hand in the sand, seen, your I've head seen, in the sand. There's a couple of really telling statements that came out in Ms. Price's testimony yesterday that completely undermined this issue that, that she was uh, taken for a ride here. Um, you know, one of the things that I noticed was her Exhibit 128. Uh, she testified, and in 128, and the court wants to look at it or not, it was a, a very, very detailed spreadsheet of, of what she's owed and what she's owed since this case started by way of maintenance and um, uh, attorney fee judgments and, and offsets. and you know, It's a pretty complicated financial statement going back to the last two years. I, I think and, so. Uh, I think I objected to its admission because I, think so, we're I don't there. know who made this thing. She said, well, I made it. I did this. And this demonstrates a very high level of financial sophistication. It, no. it is just simply not the case that someone who didn't know uh, she put numbers on a spreadsheet, wasn't very no, financially no, savvy would come stop. up with this sort of statement in Excel and, and provide it to their attorney in the middle of a litigation. That's completely inconsistent with, with her testimony that, that this was all Tom's fault. Um, you know, I think it goes without saying that after this giant bankruptcy, the fact that she was still getting cars, trips, jewelry, Vegas, Maui, all this stuff we heard about, and she just didn't ask any questions, that doesn't pass the smell test. Uh, the fact that she had read about all Nothing this stuff in this that case had happened. Nothing passes the smell test. Uh, in the Tacoma News Tribune as far back as 2010, and she still didn't ask any questions. That doesn't pass the smell test. She's got a bachelor's in business from Central. 
Uh, she's certainly got the educational background to understand all of this. No, she doesn't. Um, she admits to lying. She lied in, the, in a 2011 deposition in the bankruptcy court. That's a problem uh, in, in light of what the court needs to do here. But here's what she really did say that, that really gets to the heart of this. Uh, at one point she said, he was teaching me this stuff. And she testified about that with regard to um, various business enterprises that the two of them had engaged in throughout the marriage. And then I remember something else that stuck in my head she testified to yesterday that at one point they were sitting on lawn chairs having a glass of wine discussing what was in the manila folders that he would bring home. The manila folders being the documents that contain information regarding I can't believe they're allowing this argument because there's no testimony to support this. It, 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 it doesn't really matter. It's not going anywhere, but it's weird. Regarding, um, you know, the RCF receivables, presumably Claire and 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 Sparin and whatnot. She, she she went to great lengths to talk about these Manila folders and and how they were never left in the car and they weren't left in the office and that they would sit around from time to time and discuss them. So this this. I didn't know what was going on. I'm sticking my head in the sand now and asking uh, that you treat me as if I was victimized here. Simply should not be given any weight in, in light of common sense and the testimony that was adduced. Um, I want to correct something uh, with regard to what Mr. Robbins said about Rockwell. The Rockwell line of cases and then the cases that followed Rockwell say absolutely nothing about lifetime maintenance. They, they, don't, they, don't, they don't say that at all. And in fact, Rockwell in the case that follow it don't, don't address lifetime maintenance and don't even have those, I mean, it's not even dicta in those cases. <clears throat> what the Rockwell line of cases says. It's not even dicta. On a t-shirt. <laughs> after a long-term <laughs> marriage, the long parties should be it's placed not even dicta. in a roughly equal <laughs> financial situation for the rest of their lives. <laughs> and that very rarely, if ever, means lifetime maintenance. Because we know that <laughs> you know, typically parties retire, and then upon retirement, um, you know, the, the property division kind of takes the place of maintenance. Well, well, we certainly don't have that here. But we also don't have uh, an individual who's who's going to uh, have a an income sufficient to to meet this maintenance request until the day he dies, whether that's you know seventy or ninety, he simply just can't be required to uh, pay some absorbent amount because he's a bad guy. So that really gets me to what can we do here today, and. One of the things that is great about being a lawyer and being a judge is that we are problem solvers. We have to be problem solvers. And that's precisely what, what we all have to do here today. And what Ms. Price has presented doesn't solve any problems for anyone. I mean, it's, it's clear that this... Uh, it does for her. You know, this uh, heavy-handed, hammer-over-the-head approach I, I disagree. isn't going to work. And, and why it's not going to work is going to be a, the subject of an argument, right? Mr. Price is going to, or excuse me, Mr. Robinson's going to argue, well, the reason it's not going to work is because Mr. Price is a bad guy and he doesn't do what anyone says because he doesn't think he has to. But there's another explanation to that. The other explanation is why Mr. Price hasn't done the thing it's uh, not as good as the, the first explanation, but there is no has one. required him to do is because he can't. He cannot uh, pay what has been required of him. And we do know from the scant evidence that's before the court is that RCF's okay, income is down. We saw that in this, the uh, financial statements for end of quarter three. Uh, for 2019, and that's the newest information that we have, but we do know this from those financial statements, that RCF's gross income was half of what it had been the year before, at least at the mm -hmm. And I understand there was arguments about, well, maybe they get the rest of it at the end of the year. Um, 
maybe they do, maybe they don't. Maybe they didn't make another dollar. We, we, we don't know. But, but there is a trend there that we can look at. There was significantly left, less trend earnings is down. It's down. for RCF uh, by end of quarter three, 2019. So I, I raised that issue in support of. And my client totally told me that from his undisclosed location because he's not going to come back here <laughs> and face the warrants that are out for him. <laughs> Oh, good Lord. Of Mr. Price's position that I can't do what you're asking me to do. Um, if you put me in jail, I really can't do what you're asking me to do. I'm not doing it because I'm a bad guy and I'm, I'm trying to uh, harm my wife of 30 years. I'm doing it simply because I can't do it. The financial circumstances that have... Well, well really both. But, but mostly the first. The fallen me, <laughs> which again are no surprise to anyone having seen the history of this couple for the last 20 or so years. Um, okay, who do you believe less? Who do you believe less? The wife, number one. Number, put a number one in the chat. The husband, number two. Put a number two in the chat because I don't know who I believe less. I've watched this long and I don't know who I believe less. <laughs> Those financial circumstances prevent his compliance. He, if he goes to jail, it's debtor's jail. And that's this idea of problem solving. So what can we do? The court is looking at me for, for a suggestion. And I'm it's going even, to propose which makes sense. that <laughs> rather than there be some set amount, okay, this $25,000 for life is, is, is uh, untenable, unreasonable, unimaginable, unthinkable. It's it's almost not worthy of a response. But couldn't we do some percentage-based model? Couldn't we do something that <laughs> he, he proposes the old Hollywood will give you will give you a cut of the net. <laughs> Could we do a percentage-based model wherein we won't give you income figures? You just have to accept that when we tell you we don't have any money and you take a percentage of that. How, how does that grab you? <laughs> if Mr. Price oh, succeeds, good. Ms. Price succeeds. And, and have them both have some skin in the game here, just as they did during their marriage. Now, I'm not suggesting that they become business partners or that some interest in any of these companies be awarded to Ms. Price, because certainly I don't think the court can do that. Um, but, but, you know, if, if RCF takes off again and Mr. Price gets back up to this 240 K a year, it's good money, um, that, it, that he once made, or let's say it exceeds that, or let's say that at some point down the road, he does gain, uh, some sort of ownership interest in one of these companies we've heard of, or perhaps some other company that we haven't heard of. Wouldn't it make sense? I to don't see the end. I have, have no idea what this judge does. Share I'm with myself. those proceeds and share that success <laughs> with Miss Price. Um, that to me seems like better problem solving than dropping the hammer on him and saying, "I'm sure it does." You know, uh, 25k a month or go to jail, because that's just not going to get anyone anywhere. And again, and it's not because he's um, intentionally defying the court. It's simply because the realities, the financial realities, the historical constraints by way of bankruptcy that these two have, you know, ties its hands in certain ways. So I'm asking the court to be creative, thinking outside the box, assign some sort of percentage to gross earnings. Uh, Likewise, with these attorney fee judgments, I, I, I submit that under 2609140, we're not even in a position to talk about an attorney fee award because we don't know what, what Mr. Price's current circumstances are. But again, I suggest that problem solving would, would dictate that those be paid down the road upon some future success or reasonable or appropriate earnings on behalf of Mr. Price. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, you suggested a percentage of what, of his income? 
Yes. And what and what's the percentage we should use? I would suggest the court uh, assign 25% of gross earnings to to Miss Price, and that 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 award would be until Mr. Price retires. And, and by retirement, we would define that as um, begins accepting or receiving Social Security benefits. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> accepting Social Security benefits does not mean you're retired in the least. Boy, I don't know where to start because the fantasy spun by Mr. Nelson is just really difficult to swallow. Uh, he's asking you to believe that Mr. Price is going to be transparent in providing you with information about his earnings and his status with these companies, which is impossible to even swallow. He hasn't provided any of that. I'll just hit on a few of the highlights of um, this uh, fantasy. Jeff needs to start talking about swallowing. Rise and fall of the prices. The same. Uh, there is no evidence uh, provided by Mr. Price, either through discovery or through declarations or anything, that shows that RCF or Sparin or Claire are not viable businesses. You heard testimony from Ed LaCrosse and Sarah Hussey that RCF is a very viable and logical business. As far as the third quarter, oh, she answered that question. I mean, Ed LaCrosse answered catch, that Lily. by saying they expect uh, to receive <laughs> um, injections of cash flow upon uh, receipt of payment. And no quarter illustrates what the end of the year income is. And Mr. Price has never provided us with the last quarter, nor has he provided us with anything for 2020. <laughs> and as Ms. Hussey said, his intentional uh, depression of income and success is consistent with well, his approach well, he to did twice. Um, creating an uh, affection <laughs> of his uh, lack of ability to pay spousal support when he's under the court's uh, microscope. As soon as this is over, there's no doubt in anybody's mind on this side of the table that he will be uh, wildly successful. The other thing that Mr. Nelson doesn't speak to is the fact that in his opening argument, he says, Mr. Price admits that that had an extravagant life in 2017, 2018, and 2019. If that is true, and is what we maintain, he still refused to pay spousal support when he had the ability to pay. He still had the ability to do what he needed to do, and he willfully violated the court order in and a finding of contempt and a warrant was issued in July 2019. Um, it isn't, it's incalculable amounts of money, as Mr. Nelson called it, because we don't have any information as to what the money is. He has played this shell game, this Ponzi scheme of moving money and hiding himself so that um, we can't find this out. But what we do know is, and it's incontrovertible, that Exhibit 128, 129 shows all the trips that were taken, at least as far as the information we have in Exhibits 1, 2, and 3. We have, in fact, um, Ms. Hussey's uncontroverted testimony on the Triple P loan. And for Mr. Nelson to say she was wrong is ironic because nothing was questioned of her in that. And her position was that it was an annual look back from the date of application as to salaries, not income. And she testified that as an expert to ad, give an ad hominem uh, re, uh, reference to the triple P standards in contravention of what Ms. Hussey said is um, not acceptable. Um, and furthermore, as far as that information goes, we don't know what the year end gross was for RCF. And we don't even know where that money went. Because if we found out how much it was, we'd want to see how it was spent. Was it spent on Mr. Um, Price's apartment in Toronto where he lives, or he has an apartment with his girlfriend whose lease he still hasn't supplied? Is it where is it the trip to trips to Paris for Valentine's Day? Is it the trips to Amsterdam or to the European cruise? Who knows? But he spent this money and he had this money. Now uh, 
Oh, Mr. Robinson is so upset that, that that Mr. Price is having fun. He's not. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's just how it comes across. Um, Mr. Uh, 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 Nelson says if it would be debtor's prison because he can't do it. Well, first of all, that's not true because he can do it. At least he could do it in 2019. And second of all, um, if he can't do it, then why is he wasting his time with these businesses? He says that my client who hasn't worked for 30 years and is 58 years of age is um, hiding the ball and should go out and get a job. What is she going to do? Minimum wage? Why doesn't Mr. Price go get a job? This guy is brilliant. He could run a company. He could uh, be in the tech industry. He could do finance. This man is so perceptive and intelligent, intelligent that he can um, manipulate. Oh, sweet Jesus. But, oh, well, he's, he's, he's so perceptive and intelligent. He's also criminal and he should be in jail. Uh, what is my client supposed to do? Actually do an honest day's work? Uh, he's, he's killing me here. Manipulate uh, numbers to his advantage whenever he wants to. And yet there's no answer as to why he continues to well, waste his time. And as Ms. Hussey I'll said, definition. it's clear that the know depression of it. income during a divorce <laughs> is synonymous with someone like Mr. Price has shown. She did look at the cash flow information she had for 2019. It wasn't just 2018, but she didn't have complete records. And the testimony was that she didn't have complete records, so she was limited. But the cash flow for 2019 was not inconsistent. And the question is, why did Mike Price get all this money? And where are the loan documents from Mike Price to Tom Price? And is this just like Tom Price did with Mike Price when he Yeah, see, you should have gotten that in discovery, my friend. I know I know you tried, but you failed. He was in contempt and sitting in jail. All these coincidences are really hard to stomach. For Mr. Price to say that my client should depend upon this him you've gone to stomach. letting her know what he <laughs> earns and now he's earning nothing. $2,000 a month or nothing is ridiculous. Ken Um is as complicit and criminal as Mr. Uh, Price is, and they are buddies uh, uh, to the end, and they are going to lie, cheat, and steal for each other just like they have. And there is no way that Mr. Um, who's been financing Mr. Price by taking $535,000 from RCF, is going to make it clear that he is paying Mr. Price. He's going to continue to only make what he has to make and get the money on the side and not report it to the IRS and lead his lifestyle. And is my client supposed to hire a PI to continually track Mr. Price's trips, uh, uh, purchases, uh, dalliances, whatever you want to call it, uh, so that she can collect? I don't think so. That's It, it is not feasible, not Oh, uh, they're separated. Whatever he's doing is is, is his thing. They aren't dalliances. It's just that's just called life. Possible, Mr. Price is not transparent. He is not credible, and uh, the 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 uh, ability to set a standard of maintenance based upon historical information is totally valid within your discretion. There would be no abuse of discretion due to the willful uh, failure. Mr. I'm going Price with twenty to give us anything else to work with. <laughs> You can't say I'm not going to give you information, but then you have to make a decision, which you can't do because I didn't oh, give yeah. you information. Thank you. <laughs> well, <clears throat> you you may be surprised to learn that I think both of you made some good points. Yeah, um, we are. I, 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 I do find it, uh, as Mr. Nelson says, I do find it a little hard to believe that Mrs. Price wouldn't have some oh. clue as to what's going on. And uh, and if she yep. didn't understand it after the, up until the point of the first bankruptcy, after that she should have certainly been suspicious. When it appears that her lifestyle didn't miss a beat, and she lost possession of her house ultimately, but all the trips to Maui, all the trips to Las Vegas, all the special uh, dinners and uh, trips to Europe and cruises, and all the continuing to rent cars of that are some luxury type value and. Uh, she certainly had to realize that that was a huge amount of money per month, and uh, where was that coming and going from? Mm -hmm. um, well, that didn't make a whole lot of sense. But then, you know, this is not about 
This is not about deciding who is morally better or worse than the other one. This is substantially a case about spousal maintenance, I guess. It's hard to know what all the assets are. And uh, of course, an award of spousal maintenance is not a, a matter of right, but it is an award within the discretion of the trial court based upon the statutory factors in RCW 26.09. Mr. Nelson went through, uh, I think, uh, I think he re met, listed all of them. If he didn't, he came close to that. Um, the relevant factors do include, of course, things like the financial resources of the parties, the duration of the marriage, the standard of living during the marriage, uh, the resources and obligations of the spouse seeking maintenance, including the spouse's ability for self-support, so her ability to come and play does matter, of course. Um, it has been said that the standard of living of the parties during the marriage and the parties post-dissolution economic conditions are paramount concerns when considering maintenance and property awards and dissolution actions. And that maintenance may serve to equalize the party's standard of living for an appropriate period of time. And um, where there's a disparity in earning power and the potential of, of earnings uh, differences are great, the court has to closely examine the maintenance award to see whether it's equitable in light of the post-dissolution economic situations of the parties. And it's also, of course, been said that in determining spells of maintenance, the court has to be guided primarily by, or at least strongly, by the need of one party and the ability of the other party to pay the award, which, of course, is also one of the statutory factors Mr. Nelson talked about. Um, Mr. Robinson talked about the idea that in our case here, we've got some reason to believe that Mr. Price was operating on a million dollars a year. I, I think actually it was 1.2 million over a couple of years that she was able to document and uh, Ms. Hussey was able to document and there was a couple of other things or sources of money that she couldn't quite track down. I mean, I think there was one time an, an $80,000 cash withdrawal that she just, I had no idea where that went, who got it, and so on. Mr. Um might have gotten some of that, I don't know. It is interesting that um, they were able to do all this. And so that suggested more of an income of like $600,000 a year. And so it's funny because it's been at, at both times, at, at every time it's been in, I look at it, people have said, I think Mr. Nelson in a question yesterday said, well, Priam was an unspectacular success. And at the same time, he's mentioned that it was also a spectacular bankruptcy. If, and it didn't, it didn't, it lasted for what, 10 years or less? Um, that's um, remarkable, remarkable. And what appears to be occurring in the case of Priam. We lost you. We lost you, Judge. No. Can you hear me now? Yes. No. Can you hear me now? Uh, I said, what, so you got to the part where I said, uh, what seems to be remarkable in this, in these, in the two cases here is that <clears throat> Priam and RCF both, if managed a bit more conservatively, would have been highly successful businesses. And there was a lot of money to be made there. But what also appears to be the case is that Mr. Price, and I don't know so much about what Mr. Um was doing, although we do know, I guess, that there was a that he's borrowed over half a million dollars from RCF. And it appears that Mr. Price authorized that because Mr. LaCrosse was surprised by it. Didn't look like he did it. Um, but that they did treat RCF as their own business. And they didn't have a lot of concern about the interests of other people in it. <clears throat> uh, when this thing was originally concerned but operated by Mr. Sweeney, I don't know, I haven't heard anything from him about whether he's got any complaints about how things happened. He may have understood that he was kind of a front person for this all along, I don't know. Um, that he probably, for whatever reason, that uh, didn't continue and Mr. LaCrosse got in. It does appear that um, spending picked up a little bit when the Sporin Leclerc thing got, in, got going. And certainly the traveling did. And there was some better uh, 
explanation or rationale for the international spending, at least potentially, if they were traveling on behalf of Claire. But uh, as I understood it, Mr. Price's income was coming from Sparrow, at least in part. I mean, he had the he had a five thousand dollar a month management or employment agreement with them. He didn't have any particular employment agreement with Claire, as far as I know. That he's traveling for Claire. Now, Sparrow had an interest in Claire, and maybe up to up to forty six percent or something at one point. Forty six and a half, I think, is what it was. Um, so maybe there was uh, something there that made some kind of sense, but but the uh, spending didn't come out of Claire's pocket. Sparn itself apparently had no operating income, but what it did have was this interest in Claire. And it Don't didn't get any dividends Claire. from Claire, as far as I can tell. But what it did do is it enticed a lot of investors. And it looks like... Claire's got a very lucrative OnlyFans account. Now, come on. Well, depending on what numbers you look at, sometimes two and a half million, to maybe as much as four million dollars or so, which came into Sparn as much of, in the, from investors. And these are probably were not equity investors, as they were people who lent money uh, to Sparn, and Sparn supposedly used that to up, obtain more and more interests of Claire. But of course, again, a lot of money was spent then on Sparn's behalf through the spending of Mr. Price. And I'm not so sure about Mr. Ohm so much. It's not clear because I don't have any much information about his role in all this. But Mr. Price was evident, again, even though Mr. Lacrosse was was always the beginning and end, if you will, of Sparn, Mr. Price was able to completely dominate what was paid there and so on through the operations, through establishing who the bookkeepers were and having the bookkeepers respond only to him. And so there was lavish spending all right, and there were, these were profitable businesses all right, but the spending was in excess of the, of the profits, if you will, of the business. And uh, to the extent that the, the investors in RCF in particular got paid back their promised returns because the business was basically good, Although there was, of course, we had the information from Ms. Hussey that the way that the accounting of that worked may have been that the investors got uh, disadvantaged uh, wrongfully. I don't know whether that's right or wrong or not, but certainly she claimed that was part of the deal. Still, they got their money back, and they got more than that, and that was enough largely to keep them happy. It reminds me a little bit about the movie The Producers. Mm -hmm great film but the whole idea there was is that if we have a we can we can we can we can collect as much money as we want from the investors in the play if the play bombs on day one everybody will not expect to get any money and no one will look real hard at the books because we all know it was a failure so what's the point well if everybody at least got paid their back their money that's fine but there, of course there were other responsibilities here I mean the true owners of these things presumably Mr. Sweeney and Mr. Lacrosse were entitled to certain things and of course to the extent that the businesses made money and income, and that was subject to income taxes, then the federal government had an interest in all this. And if you properly inflated business expenses as personal expenses, you want to avoid your own personal income tax liability. Also avoid uh, income tax liability for the businesses, so on, all at the expense of the federal government. And that, of course, provides more cash flow. And it looks like some of this, it looks like a lot of this was going on. And if the spending hadn't been quite so heavy, this could have worked out real well. And I think that the reason why the spending was able to continue low as long as it has was because of this extra two to four million dollars that came in on the Sparn side. Because I think if this had just been SPF, that would have that would have either caused people to cut back on their spending, or it would have resulted in the investors not getting what they were expecting to get, and the lawsuits would have started happening all over again, just like happened with Graham. And that would have brought this to a, a bigger conclusion. But one of the questions I had for Mr. Robinson, I think early on in this thing, or after maybe after a day or so was, all right, so if Mr. Price is, if you will, illegally siphoning off a whole bunch of money here, which does kind of look like and I don't mean illegally in the sense that it wasn't authorized. It doesn't look like whoever was an authority much cared or was watching the was watching it very carefully. 
I don't know that Mr. Sweeney much cared. Um, the investors got their money back, so they didn't much care. Mr. Lacrosse, I think, frankly, uh, you know, Mr. Lacrosse seemed like a likable guy in one way, but on the other way, he seemed to me to be woefully naive about all this. And in some ways, spectacularly uninformed about his own business. He was looking for passive income, just like the, 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 the debt investors, and they were, as long as he got it, he was happy. Once he didn't get it, then he started complaining. He could have complained sooner. You know, and that's a little bit like Mrs. Price, too. I mean, she was getting a big chunk of money here, and she didn't much care how it happened. At least she wasn't care enough to look closely at it, even after suspicions were raised. But it's hard to, it's hard to justify maintenance on the basis that Mr. Price can continue to dupe the federal government and investors. I mean, there's some limit to that. Um, Otherwise, in some ways, I'm kind of encouraging him to continue to do all that, and I think he should stop doing that. I think he should figure, I don't know if he's got a, I mean, there, there one, it may be just greed, but it could, it could also be that there's a mental health condition. I mean, I've heard of people spending to feel better, and uh, uh, there's certainly been a, a, a lavish, as I think it was Mr. Nelson's word, and I don't disagree with that, spending here. Limousines to and from the airport at Las Vegas, that doesn't necessarily cost a whole lot of money because the, the, the hotels in Las Vegas are about, about a $20 or maybe less taxi cab ride. They're close to the airport. So what's the point of the limousine except to feel important when you drive up in front of the hotel instead of in a taxi cab? I don't know. I don't know. That makes no sense to me. His his vision of Vegas is about fifty years old, but that's okay. And you know, <laughs> thousands of a couple thousand dollars or five thousand dollars, whatever, for a bottle of wine makes no sense to me. Um, and that was not for that was not for whining and dining a client. That little special bottle of wine was for them to celebrate a, a business success. Um, and so that didn't have to be spent. But again, it wasn't anybody's money, right? So it was easy to spend nobody's money. If Mr. Price had been content to keep to his salary instead of having the business pay for all lots of his living expenses, that would have been, I suspect, money differently spent. But Mr. Price and Mr. Irwin regarded this as their property. They treated this RCF in particular as exactly their property and no one else's. So. Uh, they didn't much care about it. Uh, I, I don't. I don't agree with Mr. Robinson that I should essentially give Mrs. Price everything because Mr. Price is a bad guy. This is Mr. Price has certainly hidden things. He's been less. He's been not forthcoming with information. Uh, he, he does seem to have been hiding his income uh, and effectively transferring his income into as the business expenses in order to avoid it as income. Uh, I don't think he did that necessarily to harm Mrs. Price because he was doing this to avoid his creditors anyway. This was his way of just doing this. is no more operating procedure for him. Um, it is possible, as Ms. Hussey indicates, at least some of these things with respect to making collections on some of the uh, uh, RCF uh, uh, receivables uh, groups uh, so postponing some of that to postpone income that may well be occurring, uh, at least for a period of time. Uh, you know, and that's another way by which people can manipulate their income. They simply take it in another year. So, I, so it does leave one in the situation of what do you do about all this? Now. Uh, I guess I will say Mr. Robinson, I think, has done a remarkable job of putting all this paper together. And um, um, and Mrs. Ms. Hussey also did, I think, a remarkable job of trying to piece together what it all meant. If memory served, her bill at the moment was like $48,000, and there was like a $5,000 retainer paid. So she's, her bill is somewhere in the vicinity of $54,000. And uh, I do think that was all necessary to try to get uh, the heart of what all this is. Uh, and that Mr. Robinson uh, does appear got more information by subpoenaing these records than he was able to get through the discovery process with Mr. Price, and so it looks like all of that was necessary. 
and um, and I don't see any way in the world that Mrs. Price is ever going to be able to pay for this unless Mr. Mr. Price has to cover this. He does have access uh, to a lot of money. I do think he's a brilliant guy, but I do know I do wonder if there's a if there is a fundamental character flaw. I mean, I'd like to, have to operate my business, but I wouldn't like him to own any of any have anything to do with where the money is spent. Um, I'm not sure he's capable of controlling that. Um, again, that may not be a character flaw. Maybe just what he's decided to do with things. Um, so, I, so I don't know that the, the twenty-five thousand dollars a month, which is the equivalent of three hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, essentially after taxes, would be appropriate. It, it, I, I am willing to to believe that Mr. Uh, Price was operating on the basis of. $600,000 a year in cash flow, if you will, because of all this. But I do think a fair amount of that cash flow was essentially illegal um, in the form of, of expenses covered by a business for which he was not, he, he really should not have taken. They were not legitimate business expenses. Uh, he's able to, as I say, depress his income, depress the income of the businesses, depress the returns to the owners of the business and or to the folks that had the receivables inventories. All this, who knows what the impact is going to be on Sparn and Claire about all this. I'm not sure he's getting the $5,000 a month from Claire anymore. Uh, he was getting the $10,000 a month, evidently, from SPF, plus the $15,000 per quarter bonus, which means another $5,000 a month. So that's $15,000 a month that we know about for sure. Uh, as I say, I do think he was able to move money around. The, the, the money to his father also seems dubious, uh, and it does seem out of the amount of monies that were going to his father's side of this thing it seemed way out of proportion to whatever contributions his father was making to SPF. Or, 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 or RPF. RCF. RPF, yeah. Um, and uh, but Joe, the thing is, Mr. Price has shown has shown has shown not a, a purely selfish heart about this stuff. Well, maybe it makes him feel better personally, but he has provided funds for his for other people, for his spouse, at least along the way. That he he did provide for his children. He just, he did sort of help his father out, and his father's helped him out. There does seem to be a streak of family loyalty there, which sort of that might be. Um, more important to him than the money, or at least he's perfectly willing to move it around to that. Um, I, it does seem to me that there are, uh, when we looked at all the factors about post-secondary education, for instance, it does like that the parties had their own history of, of post-secondary education. They considered that important. They had the children in private schools. They've paid for the education of their two daughters. Uh, they've now got one son that's left who's of, who's of uh, college age and is attending school. Uh, I don't know. I didn't get any information. The tuition about uh, Washington State University, but less more less money at a state school than at a private school. Uh, it seems to me that's a reasonable thing to do, and I would order that Mr. Price continue to pay post-secondary educational aid in the form of tuition, at least, uh, for his son. Um, I, I don't know what it's costing him for housing and all that kind of stuff, but. Um, I would order him to give at least five hundred dollars a month over and above. Uh, I don't know what he does. Tuition and books and any other kind of direct school fees. I'm on the edge of my seat here. For that, it could be if they start doing everything from home, he's going to be wind up coming back to live with Mrs. Price again. I don't know, or somewhere else, and he's and he's going to telecommute at least for a while here, based on the COVID crisis. I understand at least if some colleges are doing that already. Um, so I will require him to pay Ms. Hussey's bill and Mr. Robinson's fee. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how much it's more than $150,000, but at this point I'll say $54,000 for Ms. Hussey's fee. I'll say $165,000 for Mr. Robinson's fee. Yeah, good luck with that. Now, I think that he probably could have, that Mr. Um, Price really has a, an effective income 
uh, of, of closer to $400,000 a year than the $600,000 a year. The other, even though he got the 200, the extra 200,000, and I do think so. I do think that was an excess of what he realistically is doing here. Um, he acknowledges essentially $240,000 a year, which was the, the the 10 and the five plus the other five from Sporin. I don't know if that other five from Sporin is still going to be forthcoming, but he still evidently has some interest in Claire, so my guess is somewhere along the line he's got that money. So I would base my analysis as to what his, his, spells, his ability to pay spells and maintenance is, is on a, a gross uh, $400,000 income. He's got to pay taxes on that of some amount of money. Whether he does or not, I don't know. That's between him and the Internal Revenue Service. I suppose the audits may have something to do with all that. But uh, even if you split the $400,000 a year, you're now looking at something less than $20,000 a month. So I, I'm thinking that the spousal maintenance ought to be about $13,000 a month. Um, that is modifiable based upon any kind of change of circumstances. It should be paid for uh, to her um, uh, until her death or remarriage. And as I say, it's modifiable. Uh, so if she remarried, that would terminate that. I'd award her the Microsoft stock, all the personal property, household goods, furniture, furnishings, clothing, jewelry in her possession. I'll award um, all the personal property, furniture, furnishings, and clothing in Mr. Price's possession. With respect to the watches, which seem to be a fairly large item, it does seem to me interesting and, and logical that while they didn't own anything in terms of cars or real estate and that kind of thing, which are sort of more obvious things, that jewelry is an interesting choice by which to lodge property because it's the kind of thing that in a, that a thing, if things got tough, you could, one, hide it easily, two, you could transport it easily. You wouldn't have to worry about it, getting it from a bank or financial institution or liquidating it like real estate. So it's much more difficult for creditors to get to. It's oh, a logical place you. to deposit assets, if you will, and convert them into. Um, she's indicating she thinks his watches are worth up to $100,000. I can't remember what the names of them were. She listed, I think, three names of them in the, in the, during the testimony. I don't think my notes ran. I don't think I typed fast enough for that. But I'll require him to turn over at least the two, the two that she identified over the less expensive I think there was one that was like $55,000 or something. You can have that. The other two, you should turn over to them. Other than that, they can keep whatever property they've got. As for the um, the capital loss carry forwards, I mean, I, I agree with Mr. Nelson about that. I don't think either one of them, although maybe Mr. Price can, because we don't know his whole circumstance, but I don't, I, I, if, if they don't own any capital, except for maybe the Microsoft stock, they can't really use it very much. Um, there's no reason to award it all to one. Or I'll allow them to, to I'll, I'll split whatever that is. It's the several million dollars worth. But they can, that can be divided 50-50. As for the points from American Express, I'm not going to award that to anybody. I don't know what to do with that, to be honest with you. Um, that can, that can stay with Mr. Price. I suppose he gets the benefit of it in, the, in that these points add up. The company pays the bill. He gets the benefit of the pride because it's own because it's being paid on his personal and Amex card. Um, uh, as for the as for the legal fees, it seems to me that we're awarded already. It seems to me that if the total bill is one hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars, all of that is included. I'm not going to have Mr. Price have to pay the legal fees twice. So. Whatever that is is whatever that is. It looks to me like 165 should cover the whole thing. So I'm not going to necessarily say that about all that in terms of the prior judgments merging. As long as the prior judgments are included in the 165, then they should merge. Okay. Um, as for the finding of contempt, I haven't got any information about whether he's still in contempt or not, and I don't, I don't intend to pass any judgments on all that. 
we'll get you your notebooks back. The court okay. finds that uh, uh, that the court has jurisdiction over the subject matter of the parties. That it will uh, that the decree is the decree dissolution of marriage should be entered. That the marriage is irretrievable and be broken. Uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Price can have her, her uh, Microsoft stock. As for the businesses, uh, I don't know whether or not you know, legally Mr. Price has an interest in any of these things. I mean, he's done a great deal to make sure that legally he doesn't have an interest in any of these businesses. But if he does, I will not award all of it to Mrs. Price, but I will say that she's entitled to 50% of whatever his ownership interest is in, the, in Claire LLC, Sparn LLC, RCF, any of the individual RCF receivables pools and the uh, select LLC. I don't know what to do with the uh, possible bank accounts that Ms. Hussey talked about. We're not sure what those are or who they are, but I guess I would note that uh, so I'm not dividing those, but if it turns out that's property of the marriage, then of course under Washington law, that's community property, and if it's undivided, it should be, it should therefore go 50-50 to them. Um, I'm not sure what else to talk about there. I think that covers everything. Have I omitted anything? Um, I ha may I ask a question? Yeah, yes, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, we had uh, the arrearages for spousal support that we asked uh, oh, sure. that those remain because we don't have judgments for... No, that, those should be reduced to a judgment. Uh, we do have a, this Exhibit 129, I think. Uh, yes. Mr. Nelson referred to it. Um, it, it. I mean, there's 128. Yeah. 129s are travel expenses. He didn't, he didn't plan uh, on paying it, so it is the way I see it. There were some. Uh, there were. She did give him credit for some American Express bills and stuff that he paid on her behalf, and that should be credited, of course. Right. Uh, I, I haven't heard anything that suggests that her accounting here is is inaccurate. So, yes, the court will award the spells of maintenance that has been unpaid. Of course, he has credits for some payments here. Um, even if his income was reduced substantially, it doesn't look to me like he couldn't have paid something on all of this. And Mr. Mr. Robinson made the point is if this is really not paying him anything anymore, although there's no real information of that either, why would he continue to operate these businesses? Why would he not move on to something else? Uh, so I don't believe he's getting nothing from all this. Now, I'm not going to terminate it when he attains the age of, of when Social Security starts to draw, in part because one can start to draw Social Security at age 62 whether or not it's needed or not. He could potentially ask for it to be for some kind of Social Security disability income. I don't know what that might be about. And of course, if he does qualify for that quite legitimately, that might be a basis for modification. But I don't know. Um, he could ask for the, the Social Security draw just to cut off her spousal maintenance, even if it costs him money in terms of it being an illogical decision independently of anything else. It would make logic if he could then cut off the thirteen thousand dollars a month household maintenance. So we're not going to we're not going to set it that way. But if his income is, uh, he can document that his income is substantially reduced, in the sense that it is a significant that there's a, you know, significant change of uh, circumstances. Well, the court would modify it, and then that puts the onus on him as opposed to as some kind of a, percentage thing, because we don't know what his income really is. Uh, and that's largely um, due to factors that are controlled by him. And so, uh, no, we're not going to require Mr. Robinson to put a private investigator permanently on staff to track this down. He's going to have to make the application, and he's going to have to make the showing, at least initially, to, to change the, the maintenance. Any other questions? Um, it is the start date September 1? Sure. That's fine. I think Senior, I just have two clarifications. Um, I didn't quite get all the details regarding 
post-secondary tuition. I heard that he would pay the tuition at WSU, and that there was something about five hundred dollars after that. Uh, t t tuition, books, and other direct school fees. Looks like we've lost Mrs. Uh, Price. Um, and five hundred dollars a month while he's in uh, school for sort of room and board type expenses. Okay. I'm sure that's not. I'm sure that's not adequate, but that's a contribution. Uh, there's nothing to suggest his son uh, couldn't help support himself <laughs> by getting some kind of job or something. Okay, and then um, the the last order was that 50% of any business interest held by Tom Price um, held as of the date of the decree. Well, I would I would say certainly yes about that. If he acquired some property, separate property, I haven't heard about that. I might be sympathetic to letting him have whatever that is. But on the other hand, if he's taken things out of his name that were in his name at the, when this thing started, um, then I'm not I'm not sympathetic about that at all. So, I guess I would say that uh, it was in his name as of the date of separation. Or or remain or or in his name now. Okay, I guess really what I'm getting at is I think it was pretty clear from the testimony that all these companies that were talked about, um, he he wasn't a you know titled owner of. I mean the argument was made that he acted like the owner. Um, right. But but we're not we're not saying that she's getting fifty percent of these companies that he acted like an owner in. Just something that, on a date certain, he actually was title. Well, I can tell you what I suspect. <laughs> and I suspect that they thought Mr. Lacrosse was a perfect dupe, and I think he largely was. And when he became difficult, Mr. Um bought him out. But Mr. Um and Mr. Price are loyal to each other, at least seems to be. So far, so far they have through all the years of Priam and all of this. And as I mentioned before, Mr. Price would have had to approve the over half a million dollars in loans that were given to me. That's Trump. great. What's your ruling? And he did all that, among other things. So it wouldn't surprise me now that since now they've got a more compliant owner, Mr. Um, that is, that there isn't some understanding between Mr. Um and Mr. Price that they remain joint owners of these enterprises. Does that answer your question? Yeah, well, I think so. I think I think I understood that a business that he holds title in, date of separation or date of decree. Mm -hmm. well, uh, or anywhere in between. Or any or anywhere in between. Got it. But that does include RCF, Sparn, and Claire, or I'm any derivative. I'm specifically talking about those at the moment. If yeah. there's some other business, that's fine too. But those specifically. There's reason to believe he had a, he had some kind of ownership interest in them. It may not be true because it's not been documented that he does. So if it turns out he doesn't, of course, Mrs. Price gains nothing because she only gets 50% of nothing if he doesn't own it. If he does, then the attorney he does said and she shares equal. He was ambiguous about ownership of a, a company, and he, he, the judge needs to make clear whether his ruling is he owns the company and she owns half of it, or he do, or he doesn't. That's he asked for that clarification. I completely understand because they were those interests were achieved through community efforts. In in reference to spousal support, that includes the uh, medical insurance that she will have to. Um, yes get in, in independently and the ongoing storage fees for the furniture after September 1. Yeah, well, yeah, she's on her own for all that stuff after. Okay. You know, because the temporary orders will go out of out of out of effect. So anything that any bills he's supposed to be paying, he will no longer have to pay as of September 1. The two So if she wants to keep the storage thing, she's going to have to pay it on her own dime. Of course, he's now going to owe her the 13,000 a month. Gotcha. Uh, the two watches were the Breitling and the H-U-B-L-O-T, Hublo or Hublo, I don't know how to pronounce it. Mm -hmm. um, that she. I think that's right. I think those were the two. 
The bright lights okay. in his watches. Do we have a date certain by when he's to provide those to Ms. Price? As far as I'm concerned, he has. To, he should turn them over immediately. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. This has not been easy for anyone. No. No. And um, this is an, an unusual circumstance. Let's schedule like the 25th of September for presentation of final paper. 25 September? Yeah. Okay. Does that work on everybody's calendars? Yeah, I think so. I'll try to get, I mean, I'm not going to be able to get the papers done for a couple of weeks and we may need to ask Katrina for a transcript just for purposes of refreshing. Sure. If that date winds up not working, just work with Mrs. Winnie and we'll get a new date set. I just want to make sure there's something on the calendar so people don't drop the date. Yes, absolutely. Appreciate that. Okay. So uh, Mrs. Winnie will put it on our calendar for the 25th for presentation. You'll still have to confirm the motion with her or okay. confirm the presentation. Um, so if the, And hopefully you'll be able to circulate the documents before that. Maybe you can agree as to the form of the order. That'd be great. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you, Ryan. Good thank luck, everybody. Have a good day. You thank too. You. Well, there you have it. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have. Uh, I would have cut that off shorter. But I get yelled at if 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 you if I don't go to the end. That's the whole hearing. That was it. That was his ruling. I don't do this. It's odd. Um, th that ruling, if you base it on what the judge said, he said, I think you make about $400,000 a year and he, and he's hitting him with 13,000. That's absolutely draconian. It's insane. Do not ever get married. However, I don't believe because having said that he didn't disclose anything. We don't believe it. So, so in there, he... Here, here's the problem I have. I think the judge might might have have done something fairly reasonable in reality, but as a matter of law, not even close. Now, I, I don't handle this sort of thing, but you, you're talking about the, the, by hit by the by the reasoning he gave in his decision. He's talking about giving sixty percent of the man's income for the rest of his life to her after the kids are grown and she's been provided for her whole life. That's insanity. Now, he's probably hiding money and he can probably pay for it easily, to be honest. He's not going to pay for any of it. He's, he's going to duck all of this. But I, I'm just I'm just getting back intellectually to, to the decision at hand. He is saying, I think you make $400,000 a year and I think you should pay this woman 13 of it. That's nuts, in my opinion. I don't do family law. I certainly don't practice in Washington. I could be completely wrong. But if that's the rule... Run like hell, people. That's crazy. There you go. If you want, if you want to know my real thoughts on it, th 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 there they are. Having said that, I'm sure he's lying. I'm, I'm sure he's got a bunch of money sacked away. If if he if he wants, he could probably pay it. But you're saying the basis of your judgment is you make four hundred thousand dollars a year. That's what the judge said. You make four hundred thousand dollars a year. Pay uh, two hundred thousand dollars for the forensic accountant for a hussy. I mean, and you know this this is an accountant. This isn't like a good hussy. <laughs> pay pay fifty thousand dollars for an accountant. One hundred fifty thousand dollars for an attorney who who made the art. Who by the way made the argument that that husband should go to jail, but we should still get paid twenty five thousand dollars a month plus thirteen thousand dollars a month. And I'm basing this on an impl uh, my implication that you might make $400,000 a year. Sorry. I, I, it's not my area of law. Maybe I'm completely wrong. I just look at that and say, absolutely not. That's insane. There's no statutory scheme that would permit that. That's what I think. Having said that, I think he's hiding a bunch of money, and he and he didn't cooperate with the court, and and the judge is sort of presuming that he he has more money than that, which is probably correct, but it's not a good, it's not a proper legal basis to to form a judgment. That's the way I see it. I could be wrong. If you want the law talk with Mike, take Mike, take 
after after uh, um, several white claws, that's what it is. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out. I appreciate it. That was a that was a different one. That was a different one, but I but I thought it was interesting. I thought it was like too serious. And then as he, like I said before, I got in. I didn't notice names. I didn't notice. I didn't notice the forensic account account name was Hussy. <laughs> I didn't notice that we had a, then we had an um in the group. <laughs> I knew my chat would I knew my chat would find the humor. I knew it. I knew it. All right. Thank you all. I appreciate it. I'll see you soon.